Introductory Note of the Amazons Read by Mullane Introductory Note of the Amazons An Original Farcical Romance By Arthur W. Pinero This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Although the Amazons was presented to the public a couple of months earlier than the second Mrs. Tanqueray, it was actually a later work. Indeed, Pinero may be said to have written this merry and fantastic little play by way of relaxation after the more serious mental effort involved in the composition of the famous drama which told the tragic story of Paula Tanqueray. Curiously enough, this delightful farcical romance, in the writing of which Mr. Pinero was apparently prompted by no more weighty motive than the indulgence of his own playful fancy, for all the amusement it was worth, stands in order of composition immediately between the second Mrs. Tanqueray and the notorious Mrs. Ebsmith. It may thus be regarded as a remarkable evidence of its author's versatility. Here he attempted no criticism of life, he sought to solve no problem of morality, sociology, or psychology. He merely permitted himself to dally with the mannish woman idea in the lightest, gentlest spirit of satire and in a most whimsical mood of romance. In the tangle of Overcoat Park we seem to hear distant laughing echoes from the Forest of Arden, and in Lady Noeline Beltabet and Barrington Viscount Litterly we fancy we recognise the descendants of Rosalind and Orlando. Mr. Arthur Chudley produced the Amazons at the Court Theatre on Tuesday, March 7th, 1893, when its reception at the hands of the public was very cordial. The Amazons ran at the Court Theatre until July 8th, by which date a 111 performances had been given, a record which spells success, although it does not equal the figures of Mr. Pinero's robuster and less fantastic farces, such as The Magistrate, The Schoolmistress, and Dandy Dick. A successful tour of the provinces was made under the auspices of Mr. Fred G. Latham and the late T. W. Robertson, while at the Antipodes considerable prosperity has attended the merry little play, Messrs. Bro and Boussicault having been its Australian sponsors. The greatest success, however, yet achieved by the Amazons, has been in America. Mr. Daniel Froman produced it quite unostentatiously at the Lyceum Theatre, New York, and its triumph was immediate. The freshness, delicate humour, and unconventionality of the piece, and the quaint prettiness of the girl's masculine attire, captivated the playgoers of New York, and the Amazons became the talk of the town. Presented first in February 1894, it ran for eighteen or nineteen weeks in New York, the demand for seats being so great as to justify the management in raising the prices in certain parts of the house. Similar popularity has accompanied the piece throughout the United States, where it is about to commence its second season on the road. Malcolm C. Salomon, London, June 1895 End of Introductory Note of the Amazons An Original Farcical Romance The Amazons, a farcical romance by Arthur W. Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Persons of the Play Read by Mullane Galfred, Earl of Tweenways Read by Peter Bishop Barrington Viscount Litterly. Read by John Fricker. Andre, Count de Graval. Read by Lars Rolander. Reverend Roger Minchin. Read by Lars Rolander. Fitton, a gamekeeper. Read by Levi Throckmorton. Uat, a servant. Read by Levi Throckmorton. Orts, a poacher. Read by Levi Throckmorton. Miriam, Marchioness of Castle Jordan. Read by Algy Pug. 
Lady Noeline Beltabet, a daughter. Read by Elizabeth Clatt. Lady Wilhelmina Beltabet, a daughter. Read by Amy Graymore. Lady Thomason Beltabet, a daughter. Read by Arielle Lipshaw. Sergeant Shooter. Read by Liberty Stump. Narrator. Read by Mullane. The scene is laid first in the Tangle, an overgrown corner of Overcoat Park, and afterwards at Overcoat Hall. Great Overcoat, as everybody knows, is a two hours railway journey from town. The events of the play occur during a single day in a fine September. End of Persons of the Play The First Act of the Amazons, a farcical romance by Arthur W. Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The scene represents a thickly wooded, overgrown corner of Overcoat Park. There is a small clearing up to a dense thicket, and a ragged hedge which is broken by an old five-barred gate, while prominently in the foreground are, on the left, the stump of a felled tree, and on the right an old tree with a wide hollow in its trunk. Beyond the gate is a prospect of a woodland, pierced by gleams of bright light. It is a fine, warm morning in September. Some golden leaves are on the trees, a few have fallen. The whole scene is warmly coloured, and poetical in suggestion. Ewart, an aged servant in livery, opens the gate for the Reverend Roger Minchin, who advances on to the clearing. Minchin is a type of the country parson of the old school, white-haired, red-faced, hearty in manner. No sign of a ladyship here, you ought. We'll find her, Mr. Minchin. Wiping his brow. Oof! Closing the gate. My lady and the family are very partial to the tangle of fine days. The tangle? That's what the family call this corner of the park, sir. Looking off and removing his cap. Here is my lady. Miriam, Marchioness of Castle Jordan, approaches carrying a camp stool. She is a tall, splendidly handsome woman of middle age. Shaking hands heartily with Minchin. Mr. Minchin! How are you? You so seldom come to see me. Shall we walk back to the hall? <coughs> if you don't mind. Get your wind? Certainly. Ewart, has Shooter gone to the station to meet Lord Noel? I believe so, my lady. Ewart goes away through the gateway. Well, I see what you're thinking about. Lord Noel? That's Lady Noeline? From your point of view, yes. Oh dear, oh dear. Noel has been staying with the Mrs. Vipont in town for some weeks. The Vipont's have been kept in London, you know, by the late session. I miss Noel sadly. Referring to her watch. He will be at the hall in half an hour. Will he? And your two other girl, uh, boys? They spent their August in Scotland. They've been home some days. Walking about restlessly. It chafes me so to think I am not at the station myself to meet my eldest son. You deputed whom did I hear you say? Sergeant Shooter. Man or woman? From your point of view, woman, I suppose. Why, sergeant? Late husband held that rank in Castle Jordan's old regiment. What duties does she, he, perform here? Teaches my boys boxing, fencing, athletics generally. Oh. A splendid fellow. At the same time, I should dearly like to have gone to Scrumley Station to meet Noel. You're detained here, I gather. Detained? I don't venture beyond the park nowadays more than I can help. 
You know why, sure. Hmm, well... You know what they call me outside, at Great Overcoat, and Little Overcoat, and at Scrumley, ah, even in London. Yes, yes. The eccentric Lady Castle Jordan, the eccentric. My dear Lady Castle Jordan, the truth is that I have presumed to call on you this morning in the hope that I may be permitted to modestly reason with you on this very subject. Again? Once more. Sit down. They sit, she on the camp stool, he on the stump of a tree. To begin with, it would be disingenuous to conceal from you that I do constantly hear very severe strictures passed upon your line of conduct. You've heard of them for the last ten years, ever since my husband died. But these strictures are more severe now than ever, and with some justice. When your children were children, there was small harm in your playfully regarding them as boys, and allowing them to romp and riot. But today, here are three young women. No. Three strapping young women. No. I will repeat, I do repeat, three bouncing young women. Well, in detail... I admit, my children, are perhaps what you describe, but in disposition, in mind, in muscle, they are three fine stalwart young fellows. But Great Overcourt and Little Overcourt and Scrumley do not look upon them as— A Great Overcourt and Little Overcourt and Scrumley are competent judges of my bitter heart-burnings and disappointments. You knew Jack, my husband— Ah, oh, yes, indeed. What was he? A gentle giant, a grand piece of muscular humanity. In frame the Vikings must have been of the same pattern. And you remember me as I was twenty years ago? Looking at her. I've no excuse for forgetting. I was a fit mate for my husband. Perfect. Even in Jack's time I never scaled less than ten stone, and he could lift me as if I were a sawdust doll. Old friend, oh, old friend, what a son my son and Jack's ought to have been. She goes to the gate and leans upon it, turning her back to Minchin, who has also risen. But... But, but it didn't please Providence to send you some. Beating the gate. Oh, oh! Come, come, do learn to view the matter resignedly. Girls, girls! It's an old story now. Girls! Why despise girls? Many people like girls. Bless my heart! I like girls. You can recall Nolene's arrival. I was sure she was going to be a boy. So was Jack. I knew it. So did Jack. The child was to be in christened Noel, Jack's second name. Yes, I was up at the hall that night, smoking with Castle Jordan to keep him quiet. Poor dear. I remember his bending over me afterwards and whispering. Damn it, Miriam, you've lost the whole season's hunting for nothing. Then the second. Lady Wilhelmina? Yes, Billy came next. Jack wouldn't speak to me for a couple of months after that. The only fallout we ever had. But your third, Lady Thomason. Dearest Tommy, oh, by that time Jack and I had agreed to regard anything that was born to us as a boy, and to treat it accordingly and for the rest of his life my husband taught our three children. There never was another. To ride, fish, shoot, swim, fence, fight, wrestle, throw, run, jump, until they were as hardy as Indians that their muscles burst the sleeves of their jackets. And when Jack went, I continued their old training, 
of course i i recognize my boy's little deficiencies but i am making the best of the great disappointment of my life and i well call me the eccentric lady castle jordan what do i care she sits wiping her eyes ah well well i've great sympathy but i really do think that the time has arrived now now pardon me but you can't know what you're talking about eh you haven't forgotten have you that the title went to my husband's brother in default of my being the mother of a of a complete boy of course i haven't and that this man the present lord castle jordan a wizened creature without shoulders has a son i know that a son a lady castle jordan a wisp of a woman with a mouth like a rabbit's and they have a son lord literally he's at oxford he has just come down and what do you think that young man has carried everything before him at the university everything why i heard he'd failed even to take a pass degree bother his degree he was first string in the mile and quarter mile against cambridge at queen's club he got his cricket blue and came within two of making his century at lords and in the rugby football he was the best three quarter back in the oxford fifteen that's been known for the last five and twenty years oh the torture of it now come come i don't see you don't see that this is the son jack and i ought to have had no pacing to and fro heavens if this young man had been sickly stunted freckled weak anemic red-eyed narrow-chested hush hush or better still hump-backed with one short leg it might have made me a more contented gentler woman but as it is now now and you choose this moment for suggesting that i should look matters straight in the face and realize the melancholy maternal muddle i've made you know i've had an idea for some time past but there you are not on friendly terms with the present lord castle jordan and his family friendly terms because it has often struck me that it might be a small consolation to you to know this young man never tut tut you might grow to be fond of lord literally fond of him fond of the youth that nature nature for whom i have done so much has taken from me and given to that insignificant little woman no never shall one of us exchange a word even with one of them never i say never oh dear oh dear lady wilhelmina beltabet enters below the hedge she is a sweet-looking girl of nineteen quite gentle and feminine her attire is a compromise between a boy's and a woman's her norfolk jacket reaches almost to her knees and her lower limbs are encased in stout leather gaiters she carries a fishing rod in its case and across her shoulders an ordinary wicker fishing basket why it's mr minton our oh, mother dear mr minton shaking hands with him warmly and how are you hey any sport slipping her basket from her shoulders i'm on my way down there's a little too much wind i fancy i've turned into the shelter here to die a fly opening the basket let me help you what is tommy doing this morning giving the grey mare a lesson over the hurdles hmm dangerous work please don't put such ideas into my boy's heads walking away minchin and wilhelmina sit side by side on the stump of the tree he with her tackle-box in his hand putting on his spectacles now then what are your flies red septembers and mauled spinners ah oh, you're a knowing one he ties the fly have you and mother been talking what do you think we have been doing playing leapfrog i mean talking about us G boys hmm pliers handing the pliers i guess you have mr minchin dear mother isn't worried about us is she 
me particularly i can answer that no she isn't i am silk giving the silk to him i'm glad she's not worried because do you know i'm afraid i'm going to be a great sorrow to her you of a foreboding i shall turn out badly in what way oh i'm getting worse every day mr minchin i i'm becoming so very effeminate he looks at her for a moment ho ho hush hush scissors go on it's nice to talk to you shall i tell you something very well rather funny about tommy and myself do if you ought to i don't think i ought to well then my dear if you are at all uncertain about it perhaps it would be better yes you're right perhaps it would be better that you should tell me oh well you know tommy and i have been staying up at drum durras with little lady drum have you there was a very large house party men and women he glances involuntarily at her gaiters oh we always visit in our skirts of course yes 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 well you'll never guess tommy had an offer of marriage ho ho hush you'll fall off that tomboy too now if such a thing had happened to you i mr minchin eh it did happen to me also looking round lady castle jordan reappears mother i've been the way i expect no no my fly please thank you she takes the fly from him the hook runs into his finger yeah. you're hooked extracting the hook i am sorry she gathers her tackle together and goes to the gate he heard you laugh a long way off what amuses you got a hook in my finger how good-humoured you are here's tommy tom hello the call is returned and lady thomasin beltabet a bright rosy rather rough-mannered girl of eighteen appears and leaps the gate she is in man's riding dress smartly and perfectly turned out from cap to boots mr minchin has called to see us good man how are you shaking hands heartily with minchin missed you at breakfast mater kissing lady castle jordan mr minchin how's the old horse ah oh. shaking his head i thought he went rather gingerly on that near four of his when you rode over in the summer look here you come and have a spin with me round the park one morning we'll give you a mount what you say looking her up and down my young friend i'm afraid i could not ride with you while you are in such an attire as i now see you in uh, mr minchin tommy talk to your brother thomasin joins wilhelmina and they talk together advancing to lady castle jordan lady castle jordan i i must say it i am a little shocked i don't understand you pardon me is that a proper dress for a young woman to scamper about in it is all a question of environment the poor african in her solitary row of beads is as discreet as the best dressed woman in town i will not have my boy's unconsciousness disturbed i ought to tell you this i hear that the overcot and scrumley people spend the afternoons of their early closing wednesdays in hanging about the skirts of your park vulgar curiosity there i wonder your park has skirts i have built five lodges round overcoat park expressly to protect us from intruders with the exception of one privileged old friend yourself no one enters the park but on my fortnightly thursdays glancing over his shoulder and then then my boys disguise themselves in petticoats i think he may boast that no boys have sweeter frocks than my boy wilhelmina and thomasin stroll away seeing that he is alone with lady castle jordan hmm. one word more lady castle jordan 
assuming just for the sake of argument that your boys are girls may i ask you what you do if they should ever be asked in marriage ah oh, eh, my dear mr minchin aha do you know you've chanced on a supposition that has been a reality well willie and tommy well wilhelmina and thomasin were staying at drumdurris castle two men fell in love with them and in the name of common sense why not men i call them insects merciful powers one was a frenchman well a creature who has doubtless shot a fox the other little lord tweenways tweenways a fine race the fitzbrays fine why godefroy de fitzbray was one of richard's knights in the crusade no fitzbray has ever stood higher than five feet five in his boots they're a shrivelled puny line the present lord tweenways inherits the accumulated ailments of all his ancestors and he presumes thomason and wilhelmina reappear Shh, mr minchin walk up to the hall with me we shall be just in time to greet lord Noel. i'll tell you about this business as we stroll along minchin opens the gate my dear boys don't come with us it's so long since i've seen mr minchin very well mother dear all right mater as she and minchin walk away isn't that scrumly church chime we shall be late minchin and lady castle jordan disappear Thomason sits on the tree stump. So you think that, do you, Billy? Sure of it. But why should the parson concern himself about us? He, he thinks we're girls, you know, Tommy dear. Well, we ain't, my dear William. So he's out of it. Approaching Thomason and kneeling beside her. Tom, don't you ever feel like a girl? I, well, I should hope not. But how do you know you don't? I'm sometimes afraid I do. That's because you had measles too late in life and got your blood thin. You're a manly young chap enough, considering. Am I? Of course, you're not to be compared with old Noel. He is the pick of our basket. Yes, he's very nice. Nice? What silly words you use. Why, he's the best all-round sportsman our side of the county. Even I own that. Nice. And he's a fellow that reads books, too. I never could open a book. Nice. He... he... well, he's just my notion of what a young Englishman ought to be. Hello. What's that in the hollow of that tree? Quickly going across to the tree. Oh, can you see it? See it? It must have slipped down. It's my guitar. Drawing a guitar case from the hollow of the tree. What the deuce? Mother heard me playing in my room and stopped me. She says it's girlish. Rubbish! The troubadours always played guitars. Oh, I say, ain't I well informed? Taking the guitar from its case. So I hid it here, thinking I'd creep down to the tangle sometimes and sing to myself. Hard lines? Won't the mater let you play anything? Tuning the guitar. She's promised to give me a cornet. Good business. Tune up, William. Anything pretty. Bar love rot, you know. Ah, it's so damp. As Wilhelmina is about to sing, Thomason raises herself suddenly. Look out, who's coming? Wilhelmina hastily conceals the guitar and case below the tree. Lady Noeline Beltabet and Shooter are seen going towards the gate. Noeline is a handsome, imperious girl of twenty. She wears the ordinary travelling costume of a young lady. Shooter is a good-looking woman of about thirty, suggesting by her manner and dress an association with the army. Noeline has a set, serious look upon her face. Shooter carries a travelling bag. Noel! Jumping up. Noel! Boys! Wilhelmina and Thomason grip Noeline's hands in manly fashion. How are you? How are you? How are you? How's the mother? She was here just now with Mr. Minchin. They've gone up to the hall to meet you, I expect. I got out of the carriage at the East Lodge for the sake of a walk across the park. Sergeant! 
Yes, my lord. Go on ahead. Tell my mother where I am. Don't stare at me like that, please. All right, my lord. She goes off through the gate. What is the sergeant staring at? Looking into Noeline's face. Oh! Looking at Noeline. By Jove, you don't look very fit. Nonsense. Glad to get back? Putting her hands on their shoulders. Glad. Rather. Good man. Let's sit down. Perhaps I am rather out of condition. London isn't Scotland. Thomason hands Noeline a cigarette case, from which she takes a cigarette, passing on the case to Wilhelmina. Taking a cigarette. Thanks. They light their cigarettes. You'll find these something good. I'm giving a new firm a leg up. Boys, I had your letters. So you got into a little difficulty at Drumdurris? Tween ways. Proposed, didn't he? I should think he did. Nuisance, eh? Horrid bore. Enough to turn any fellow against his holidays. What about you, Willie? Turning away slightly. A friend of Lord Tweenway's. Andre de Greville. You know, the usual thing. Plenty of moustache and vivacity. Proposed? Oh, yes. Strutting about. They behaved decently, I will say. They did go to Lady Drumdoris first, and Egedia in a great commotion wrote off to the mater. Sitting on the tree stump beside Noeline. But they couldn't wait for Mother's reply. Caddish. Perhaps Monsieur de Greval is ignorant of our customs. Tweenways isn't. Putting her arm round Noeline's waist. You're vexed. It wasn't our fault. Kissing Noeline furtively. You know, Tommy looked rather pretty up north. Looking into Wilhelmina's face. I dare say. Noeline kisses Wilhelmina, taking Noeline's hand. Looking at Noeline's hand suddenly. Ah! Oh, where's your ring? Snatching her hand away and concealing it. What? Your ring, the Beltabet ring. It's in my case. No, Willine, you know Mother believes it never leaves your finger. Thomason takes up the guitar and sounds the strings. What's that? My guitar. Sing to me, Willie. The train always upsets my nerves. Then we'll all walk home together. Wilhelmina takes the guitar and, leaning against the hollow tree, sings a pretty melody. Thomason sits on the gate. Noeline remains on the tree stump. As the song nears its close, she sinks to the ground and, leaning her head on the stump, utters hysterical sounds. Oh! 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 Oh dear! Oh dear! Wilhelmina, dropping her guitar, runs with Thomason to Noeline, raising her. Here, hold up, old man. Noel, dear Noel. Oh, boys, 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 I'm so upset. What's amiss? Do tell us. Wait a second, I will tell you. I must tell somebody. She walks up and down, composing herself. The others stand together and look on, wonderingly. To Wilhelmina. Eh? To Thomason. I can't think. I'm all right. I say, you fellows, I got into a bit of a mess the night before last. A scrape. A bother. Did you? Oh! How? You know Mrs. Vipont and her husband went down into Surrey to a political meeting he was to speak at, and as they couldn't catch the last train home, they slept at Sir Henry Carholt's at Chilmere. I didn't go, for two reasons. Never-ending politics bore me. And then I wanted to profit by their absence to see London. See London? Why, you have been seeing London for the last five weeks. Oh, yes, in my petticoats, shopping with Florence in the morning, the forlorn park in the afternoon, a cockney exhibition in the evening. I wanted to view London from the same standpoint from which we've been brought up to see things here at Overcoat. Good man. Yes, that's it. I felt that if I could only parade the streets as a man, at the hour when all the namby-pamby women of our class are being escorted here and there, lifted in and out of carriages, wrapped about in soft cloaks, half smothered by polite attentions, if only I could do this, I should indeed be a man. 
I wanted to swagger along unnoticed, to fling away my half-burnt cigarette, to see it caught up still sparkling by a ragged urchin, to throw a coin to a crossing sweeper, to be shoved and elbowed by a noisy crowd, ah, even to be sworn at. Boys, I felt that if I could only do this I should be less like a girl than ever. Oh, why wasn't I with you? And, and did you do it? Yes, I did it. Sitting on the camp stool. I did it. Oh, ho, ho. Sitting. You hadn't your dress clothes in town with you, Noel. Kneeling beside Noel. No, but I was obliged to make a confidant of Dawkins, the woman who valeted me in Chesham Street, and she and I raked out a dress suit of Bobby Vipont's. Bobby's in Switzerland, you know. He's seventeen and just my height, but everything I borrowed of him, except his white necktie, was a beastly fit. However, I was well hidden by his Inverness cape, so it didn't matter a row of pins. Then I crammed my hair under a wig that had been left over from Lucy V. Pont's birthday theatricals, and then—then then Dawkins let me out. "'What did you do? Where did you go to?' Stamping her feet. "'I did the West End. I—I I didn't like it. I—I I didn't care for anything I saw. I was tired. I was returning home. Then I got into this mess. Oh, dear! I saw a man about to hit a girl. He'd got his arm back, his fist against his shoulder. He meant it. So did I. Boys, you know what I can do. Well, before you could have said jinx, I'd slipped my big ring into Bobby Vipont's trouser pocket, and I'd landed the monster. Putting her fist under Wilhelmina's chin. Just here, Willie dear. Thomason jumps up excitedly. Noel! I've often knocked out Sergeant Shooter in the same way, but always with gloves on. Rubbing her hand with aversion. Oh, you don't know what it's like to get home on a strange man's chin without the gloves on. Did he go down? Down? Nodding and staring at the ground in agitation. I see him there constantly. I tumble over him in my sleep. Going to Thomason. Oh, Tommy! Tommy! Go on, don't stop. There was a crowd. Men and women grew out of the pavement. Brutes! No, they were friendly. They called me Governor. Let him have it again, Governor, one person advised. An awful unanimous desire seemed to possess them all to mind what they called my togs. My hat, Bobby Vipont's hat, went in a twinkling. Then terrible hands, hundreds of hands, I fancied of all shapes and sizes, were laid on my cape. I wrenched myself free and broke away, hitting about like a woman then, right and left. And I ran. I ran till I fainted. You fainted? You? Why don't men faint sometimes? What became of you? When I came to, I was lying on a sofa in a strange room, and a young fellow was sitting a little way off watching me. Noel! Noel! Well? 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 I'd fallen almost into his arms, he'd explained. He'd taken me to his lodgings to get me round. He spoke as a gentleman speaks. He—he he liked the look of me, he said. Biting her lips. How did he convey you to his rooms? Noeline shakes her head. Were you on a level with the street? No. First floor. How did he get you upstairs? Rocking herself to and fro. That's just it frowning. Think he guessed you weren't the usual sort of young man? I don't know what to think. Wilhelmina bursts into tears. <laughs> By Jove, this isn't a very nice accident to befall a young lady. Hitting her boots with her crop, angrily. Tom! Looking up. Yes, you were sent to town as a young lady. A fellow's sister, too. Well, well, well. He lent me a cap, expecting me, I suppose, to ask his name, but I snatched the cap from him and bolted down his stairs into the street. The dawn was just breaking when I found a cab. Dawkins put me to bed in a rage. When I got up, I burnt the cap and gave Dawkins two pounds in a cigarette holder. Wringing her hands. Oh, oh. Wilhelmina sobs. <laughs> you 
shut up William. After all, beyond the indignity and the humiliation of the thing, you're none the worse for the little outing. Holding out her hand. My ring! The Beltabit ring! Eh? The big ring that has never left a Beltabet's hand for so many hundreds of years. Not gone? It must have fallen out of the pocket of Bobby Vipont's silly trousers. Jupiter! The mater's angry only about once a year. This'll be it. Look out, here they are. Wilhelmina hastily conceals the guitar and its case in the hollow of the tree. Noeline draws on her gloves. Lady Castle Jordan, Minchin, and Shooter come through the gate. My dear boy! Embracing Noeline. Looking into Noeline's face uneasily. Ah, oh, London has taken all that fine bronze tint out of your face. There's Mr. Minchin. Shooter! Shooter advances, taking a letter from her pocket. Mrs. Vipont asked me to give you that, mother. She hands Lady Castle Jordan the note, and joins Minchin, Wilhelmina, and Thomason. To Shooter, while opening the note. Sergeant? Yes, my lady? Certainly, I do notice it. Lord Noel looks terribly flabby. I shall see what he does with the barbells tonight in the gymnasium. Reading the note to herself. Oh, dear Miriam, please come to town at once to hear a statement from Clara Dawkins, my maid. Say nothing yet to Noeline, as we may find the woman untruthful. Yours affectionately, Florence Vipont. Mercy, what has occurred? Mr. Minchin. Minchin approaches and Shooter retires. The girls gather together. Old friend, will you take me to London this morning? Aye. I must be protected from annoyance at Great Overcoat and Scrumbly. If you won't... But I will. Oh, thank you. Not a word. She goes hurriedly away through the gate. Lady Castle Jordan. He follows her. Shooter goes after them, going to the gate. Anything wrong, Sergeant? Closing the gate. Hope not, my lord. Shooter disappears. Why is the mater so taken up with Mr. Minchin today? It gives one a breathing time, at any rate. Come, boys, we'll go down to the bridge till lunch. Billy, bring the banjo. Wilhelmina produces the guitar again. Yes, let's forget for a little while that you've lost Dad's ring. By Jove, it's ripping to be all together again, ain't it? Ah, oh, Tom, I wish we hadn't left home this summer, any of us. Slapping her on the back. Cheer up, old man. I mean to. After lunch we'll have a pop at the partridges. Confound London! Hateful London! Noeline and Thomason go off below the hedge, running after them with the guitar. Wait for me, you fellows, wait for me! After a few moments, André de Grival emerges cautiously from the bush and undergrowth on the left below the hedge. De Grival is a good-looking, animated young Frenchman, of the type of a Grevin caricature. He speaks fluently, but his pronunciation and inflections are, like his appearance and general demeanour, very French. Pieces of twig and bracken cling to his clothes, and his necktie is disarranged. Looking about him, where have we got to? Where is it? Wiping his brow. I'm hot. Tween ways, my dear fellow, tween ways. The Earl of Tween ways crawls out of the thicket on his stomach painfully. Tween ways, my friend, here we are sheltered. We may stand upright. Lord Tween ways rises. He is a short, thin, weak looking man of about three and thirty, with a pale, emaciated face and red eyes. Although a most insignificant person, his bearing is full of affectation and his tone a haughty one. He is more disarranged and dishevelled than his companion. His clothes are covered with bracken, his hat and pocket are full of leaves, his knickerbockers are green and soiled at the knees, and at one knee there is a small rent. You don't think we've been observed? Impossible. We crawl like alligators. Allow me. 
picking the bracken from Tweenway's clothes, and otherwise putting him in order. "'That was a good place at which to enter the park, between two lodges, not in sight of each. There you are.' "'Thank you. Let me render you a similar service.' Turning his back to Tweenway's. "'My friend.' Tweenway's fastidiously removes one piece of bracken from Diggerval's coat. "'Yes, I certainly did discover the one weak spot in the fortification.' Removing the bracken from the front of his coat. "'Pardon me, I found it.' "'I found it?' "'No, no, I found it.' <sighs> "'I dare say you're right.' He replaces the piece of bracken on de Graval's coat and moves away. "'Thank you. At all event we are here, to fancy I'm once more near Wilhelmina, breathing the air she breathes, listening to the birds that sings to her, looking at—' To Tweenways, who is sitting emptying his pockets of leaves. "'My friend, you have scratched your nose.' "'No!' Applying his handkerchief. Yes, it is so. Ha! This is characteristic of us. We have never hesitated to shed our blood freely for those on whom we have bestowed our affection. We? Us? You and me? No, no, no. My race. My family. We have always been remarkable for our ardent passions. Our loves have made history, you know. Lady Castle Jordan's objection to you as a suitor for Lady Thomasine, have you heard it? Heard it? She objects to my stature, my whole physical fabric, in fact. She is crazy on the subject of muscular development. Feeling his muscles and hitting the air. Yes, yes, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Kicking vigorously. Ah. Uh. Regarding de Graval, disdainfully. We, we have never been coarse, brawny men, always delicate, fragile, with transparent veins. Our women are especially interesting. An eminent surgeon once assured me that he could make out the osteological structure of any one of our women by placing her before a lighted candle and looking at her on the dark side. We— oui. And I am rejected because I'm a Frenchman, ah? Eh? Well, frankly, with families who have made history, I can quite understand that, that— But why pain you? But I am English. My dear de Graval— English to my backbone, French by birth, yes, but so long educated in England. English is my appearance, manner, voice, I play your games, follow your sport, I speak the idiom of your language, I say, don't you know? Frequently I learn your proverbs. A great many cooks spoil your broth. Honesty is the best thing to do, a stick in time. All of them by heart, I say, damn it all, in the smoking-room. And still I am French, bah! All I can say is I've known you some time, and, well, we are judges of men. My friend, and we stick together in this affair? I will not leave this neighbourhood till I have personally renewed my proposal to Lady Thomason. I am pleased to have your companionship. But do we understand each other? For example, if one of us was asked up to the hall, that one would not march in and leave the other his friend on the outside? Speaking for myself, if I, well, dined at Overcoat Hall without you, I should certainly make quite a point of alluding to you generously during the evening. Alluding, thank you very much, Ba. Never reckon your ducks, your chickens. Snapping his fingers in Tweenway's face. Don't you know? Monsieur de Graval. Walking away. La, la, la. Oh. They walk about angrily, then meet again. After a display of indignation, Tweenways removes a piece of the bracken from de Graval's coat. Turning, conciliated. Ah, my friend. Suddenly in evident pain. Oh, oh, dear me! Queen ways you have it again. Breathing. No, no, the other was sciatica. This is cramp. Cramp. We have cramp. We have sciatica also, but every alternate generation has the cramp bias very clearly defined. Oh, dear, dear. This from creeping through the underworld. What to do? It will pass. 
I suffer with you. Rocking himself to and fro. Our cramp has made history. My mother quotes an old distich. Cold the wind and damp the day, cramp shall seize the true fit's bray. Lord Littley appears above the hedge, and, seeing Tweenways and de Graval, he looks cautiously over the gate. He is a handsome young man, with the frame of an athlete, and an air of indolence. To himself. Uh, I'll swear to that back. Aloud. I say. Turning. Eh? Going to the gate. My dear Barrington. Opening the gate. Andre. They shake hands. Tweenways groans. Oh. To de Graval. Who's your pal? Looking round. How do you do, Littley? Why, Tweeny? What are you making that noise for? The cramps. Producing a little silver flask from his waistcoat pocket. Cramp. Take a pull. Tweenways drinks. Why, we three haven't met since Lady Twombley's jolly dance that hot night in July. I say, what's this place? Overcott Park. No. Then it's my aunt's place. Certainly it is. Lady Castle Jordan, your aunt? Ah, uh, I see it. The eccentric Lady Castle Jordan, they call her, poor lady. Are you visiting? Tweenways and de Graval exchange looks. What's up? Pardon me if I speak to Tweenways. De Graval and Tweenways consult together. To himself. I say, suppose the young man I picked up, I, I mean the young woman I picked up, turns out to be my... With a prolonged whistle. I say. To Litterly. No, we are not visiting Litterly. Are you? I? My people in the Overcoat Park people have been daggers drawn for years. You will, I am convinced, thank me, Litterly, for letting you know that no one is permitted to enter this park except on Lady Castle Jordan's reception days. Sitting lazily. So I believe. My cousins are rather uncommon in their rig-outs, I've heard. Yes, yes, but... But here you are, my dear Litterly. And here you are, my dear Tweeny. Uh, excuse me. De Graval and Tweenways again consult. Litterly makes a cigarette calmly. My dear Barrington, we admit we have no rights here. The short of it is, we desire to meet Lady Wilhelmina Belturbet. And Lady Thomason. Ladies, we've had the joy of knowing at Drumderis. I say, is that it? Today we discover the only way to enter this park without notice. You think so? Well, no one saw me wriggle through a break in the fence, I swear. Ah, we came through the fence also. My dear aunt ought to have the park palings looked to. Pointing to the left. Over there. Pointing to the right. Over there. Pish! Pardon me. Tweenways and de Graval again consult. Literally chuckles. <laughs> My dear Literally, it is our deliberate intention to conceal ourselves in Overcoat Park until we encounter these ladies. I need hardly tell you that any assistance you can render us, in the shape of leaving us to ourselves, we shall esteem highly. Sitting on the grass, leaning lazily against the tree stump. I say, I was about to make a similar suggestion to you, old chap. I'm going to hang about here, too. May I ask? Why not? I'm a little interested in a lady I've just seen entering the park. I've followed her from town, in point of fact, in the hope of getting a few words with her on the quiet. So, you see, Tweeny, you can't have the field quite to yourself. Tweenways and de Graval consult together with great animation. I resent this. I resent it. Damn it all. We don't brook obstacles. A great many cooks. Damn it all. If this had occurred a few centuries ago, we should have simply slain the fellow. After further muttered conversation, they return to Litterly. My dear Barrington, it seems to us that as we are all trespassers here, and as our interests run on somewhat parallel lines, 
the best course we can adopt is to is to stick together pals i say just as you like don't put yourselves out good this is good union is strength don't you know from the distance there comes the sound of the girls voices singing to the accompaniment of the guitar and gradually drawing near hark hark it's coming here we better get out of sight certainly too literally barrington you will be looked at de graval goes off quickly literally literally preparing to rise all right old chap i'm moving along upon my word lord literally going down upon his hands and knees and crawling into the thicket scowling at literally fool fool he disappears rising slowly and listening girls voices girls he walks off after de graval then noeline wilhelmina and thomason come along singing near the gate speaking to wilhelmina look out billy here's the sergeant they cease singing wilhelmina hurriedly returns the guitar to its hiding place thomason stands shielding wilhelmina a shooter approaches from the other side of the gate my lady would like to see you up at the hall directly she wants to say goodbye 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 my lady's just off to town to town what for going to london mother has been sent for by the lawyers perhaps she's going to see the dentist very likely hairdresser i think mater's hair is coming out in sackfuls dressmaker i believe or bootmaker mater hasn't got a decent shoe to her back i mean don't stand here guessing come on boys shooter opens the gate thomason shoulders the camp stool wilhelmina picks up her rod and basket the three girls disappear and shooter follows then de graval returns excitedly to his companions st st tweenways crawls from out the thicket literally re-enters leisurely wilhelmina i have seen wilhelmina hush thomason i have heard thomason to himself my cousin the boy i picked up well the girl i picked up my cousin to tweenways did you hear lady castle jordan goes to london do you understand that dash it do you think i'm obtuse what fortune the mother goes we see them talk with them walk with them la 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 love loves at blacksmith's don't you know he dances about fantastically literally sits thoughtfully the girls are heard singing again their voices gradually becoming more distant rushing to the gate again literally rises on hearing the singing and running to the gate climbs on to the middle bar and looks off you'll be seen by the maid going down on his hands and knees and crawling to the gate fool fool he puts his head under the lower bar to watch the girls the girls are still singing in the distance end of the first act the second act of the amazons a farcical romance by arthur w pinero this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The scene is the same as in the preceding act. Fiton, the gamekeeper, an old man, is sitting and smoking a clay pipe while a dog lies near him. Calling in the distance. Fitton! Fitton! Rising and putting his pipe away. Here I be, my lord. He opens the gate. Thomason enters, followed shortly by Wilhelmina, and after a brief interval, by Noeline. The three girls are in clothes fashioned after the style of a man's shooting suit, corduroy coats and waistcoats, 
tweed knickerbockers, shoes and gaiters, everything very smart and natty. They carry their guns. Catch you waiting, Fitton. Not you, my lord. Good afternoon, Joe. Afternoon, my lord. Well, Joe, how are you? Glad to see you back again, my lord. What's the programme? I thought we'd try the plantations first, my lord. That'll do. Get us back to tea. What time, Billy? Ewett will be here with the tea basket at a quarter to four. We'll work up towards Silverthorn Coppice after tea. Birds be feeding there about sunset. Get along, boys. Thomason, Wilhelmina, and Noeline go off below the hedge, Fitton following with the dog. After a pause, de Graval comes hastily behind the hedge and clambers over the gate, calling, Tweenways, my friend. Tweenways runs up, attempts to climb the gate, falls over, and is caught by de Graval, sitting, much agitated. Confound the thing! Looking over the gate, then joining Tweenways. They have stopped running. An ancestor of mine, Oaktred Fitzbray, called the uncomely, brought inevitable destruction, so the legend goes, on those whom he cursed in anger. Curse these cows! First we come face to face with the deer, we leave them. Then we come face to face with the bulls, we leave them. Then... Oh, it's a beastly park. This is the only decent bit of retirement. Walking about impatiently. But here we do not meet the ladies. Here we shall never meet the ladies. Pardon me, if the ladies are out, they must come here to get away from the cows. One thing we may congratulate ourselves. We have lost Barrington. Ah, yes, we're rid of Litterly. Pacing up and down angrily. We soon tired him out. I am glad. To our company, three is too much. Don't you know? His society has already become intolerable to me. The boundless self-sufficiency of the man. Once, when he trod on my foot, I was within an ace of cursing him. I doubt his breeding, too. The idea of his tracking a pretty face from town in this way, the circumstance of his turning out to be the lady's cousin, doesn't excuse him. I believe he simply met her in a shop and followed her about like a snobby cad. It's an accursed impropriety. Heavens, is chivalry extinct? What, eh? With a little groan. Tween ways, my friend, I am hungry. Hungry? I feel like a disused vault. Bah, it is an hour past my lunch. You forget, you did breakfast. I didn't. I may tell you, we, we never breakfast. Turning away. We, we, we. If we miss our midday meal, we have acute sinking of the stomach. My aunt quotes a quaint old quatrain. In the battle, let the strongest, who the bold Fitzbrays would scatter, seek out those who've been the longest, parted from their cup and platter. We... My friend, I'm tired of your we. We... Monsieur de Graval. La, la, la. Leave the park. Leave the park. Facing Tweenways excitedly. Possession is nine points of your law. You forget yourself. First come, first serve. Contemptuously waving his hand under Tweenways' nose. Don't you know? Ah! They separate and walk about. Then they stand apart, eyeing each other furtively, advancing to Tweenways hesitatingly. Pardon me. To himself, struggling inwardly. Can I? Tweenways at length offers de Graval two fingers. Dubiously. My friend? Literally strolls along below the hedge, smoking. Tweenways and de Graval exchange looks of disgust. Sitting. Seen anybody? Not we. What have you been doing, my dear Barrington? Having a bit of lunch. Advancing eagerly. Where, where, where? Pointing over his shoulder. Found a most delightful rural inn close by. The checkers at Little Overcoat. I say, if you two would like to patronise it, I'll watch here for the ladies willingly. Accept my thanks, but I prefer not to quit my post. We, we never. 
nor i too i will not leave the park till i have seen wilhelmina all right you please yourselves tweenways and digraval walk about aimlessly after a pause what did they give you to eat grilled bacon oh, oh. they go off quickly below the hedge tweenways dropping on to his hands and knees and disappearing into the thicket <laughs> ten pounds to a button they follow that path to the left instead of crossing the brook i say keep to the right you fellows he goes after de Graval. directly he has disappeared noeline enters below the hedge leaning on thomason's arm how did you manage to come such a cropper put my foot in a rabbit hole what's your ankle like now oh, better but my wrist i can't hold my gun she sits on the tree stump placing her gun against the tree poor old man holding her wrist don't mind me go after billy and fitton shan't i'll pick you up in a few minutes moving her hand it's easier already there is a sound of a shot in the distance that's billy's gun to herself oh the sneak Thomason runs off unnoticed by Noeline, literally reappears, seeing Noeline and speaking to himself. My boy, my girl, my cousin. He rustles the fallen leaves with his stick, without turning. Oh, do go. I promise to join you in five minutes. Approaching her. Eh? Rising with a gasp and facing him. Sir! Who... You weren't speaking to me. I... I... I don't know you. My name is Litterly. Lord Litterly. Staring at him wildly. You? Lord Litterly? You must be one of the ladies Beltabet. Lady... Noeline. I say, we're related. Nodding, still unable to remove her eyes from him. Yes. There's no love lost between your branch of the family and mine. I suppose we don't shake hands. Certainly not. No, I thought I'd raise the point. Pulling herself together. I... I am sorry to have to tell you, you were trespassing here. Yes, yes, I suppose I am. Strolling up to the gate. I say, pretty park. Pardon me, my bootlace. He puts his foot on the bar of the gate and ties his bootlace to herself clenching her hands. How can he have found out I am the young fellow he carried home to his lodgings? The cad, to take advantage of it like this. My cousin, too. The cad. Oh! Taking up her gun as if to go, then turning to Litterly, haughtily. I don't assume that you are ignorant of the way in which my mother has trained her children. No, no, don't assume I'm ignorant. Nor do I think it worth while to defend, and to you, the lives we live here. I must say, however, that I can see only one possible disadvantage attached to our mode of existence. Taylor's bills? Going. I mean the necessity for regarding uninvited guests as unmannerly intruders. Ain't you, Nolene? Do stay a moment. I fagged down here, thinking I was perhaps going to render somebody a trifling service. A service? Just sit down a minute. Now do. Looking about. Take a... Pointing to the tree stump. Take a stump. Do. After a moment's irresolution, she returns and sits, defiantly nursing her gun, standing near her. Thanks. This is how it comes about. Do you mind going further off? Not a bit. Looking round. Ah, the Ottoman. He sits on the gate... During the scene which follows, he watches her closely, but playfully, telling his story with great relish. She listens intently, with her back turned to him, to herself after glancing at him. The utter cad. Lady Nolene, this is my little story. The night before last, as I was walking home from my club, a young gentleman, who had evidently got himself into some bother, ran straight into my arms, and, having arrived there, stayed there. The poor young chap had fainted. Well? I was puzzled what the deuce to do. 
you seemed a nice young fellow i say what would you have done i i really don't know i'll tell you what i did in the end there was no one about i couldn't drop him into the mud or hand him over to the police could i oh no you couldn't have done that no i hailed a cab and took him off to my lodgings he did seem such a nice young fellow wreathing will you please go on with your story if you must tell it me certainly where was i oh yes he did seem such a nice young fellow i don't want to hear what sort of young fellow he appeared to be no no it doesn't really belong to the story well i took him home and carefully deposited him on the sofa to herself cad he was a good-looking johnny lord literally i beg pardon that's nothing to do with it by and by he came round but i didn't succeed in making much of him i fancied he was off his head which reminded me that he'd lost his topper so i offered to lend him a cap i say you should have seen the way he grabbed at it and he bolted down my stairs and in point of fact hooked it getting off the gate now this is the story it was a new cap he hadn't even said thanks for the loan of it and that riled me so down i went after him and followed his cab to a house in chesham street ha <laughs> ha what do you think of that i i fail to see the smallest necessity for you to to have followed this person about it was a brand new cap you might have known it would be returned to herself recollecting oh well i did follow him and there it is now notwithstanding his bad form he still struck me as being a nice young fellow rising i cannot yes now i think of it that does belong to the story looking at her fixedly he seemed such a nice young fellow that somehow i couldn't drive him out of my head and next day i found myself hanging about that house in chesham street hesitating whether i'd go and bang away at his door with her eyes averted what for still watching her intently what for well there was the cap a paltry cap a new paltry cap however i didn't knock i'm such a slow man but early this morning i was in chesham street again and while i was lolling against a lamp-post out you came with another lady and got into a luggage brougham i say it was an awful job chasing that brown to paddington station the idea of your doing such a thing what an intolerable liberty she goes indignantly up to the gate where she stands with her back to him the mere idea of it oh to himself watching her admiringly i say she's glorious i and to think that i carried that up seven and twenty stairs she hates me for it but i've counted em to her lady noline there's a look in your shoulders that tells me you'd like me to explain why i followed you she quickly changes her position still averting her face the fact is i saw a strong likeness in you to that johnny the sort of likeness a big sister might bear to a cub of a brother and i felt an uncontrollable desire to have a jaw with you leaning against the trunk of the tree you know i didn't find out till an hour ago that we're cousins eyeing him furtively however marked the resemblance may be between me and the individual you picked up you will find it difficult to justify your pursuing a woman in this way wanting a jaw doesn't quite do it lady noline i thought if i could get five minutes chat with the girl who bears such a strong resemblance to that nice young fellow i could advise her to keep an eye on shall we call him her brother in future i thought i might through her save that nice young chap from some day falling into another difficulty when perhaps there would be no me to pick him up carefully and take him out of harm's way i thought perhaps i might convince him through her that the west end of london the worst end of london at night-time is not a locality where even a self-respecting cat may trust himself and this lady noline is how i come to trespass in overcote park to herself in a low voice he's not such a cad 
It's positively delicate of him to avoid referring to me point-blank. He can't be an out-and-out cad. To Litterly, her tone slightly altered. I... I understand now the service you wish to render, and I... I... I quite appreciate your intentions. There's one other small matter. Taking a ring from his waistcoat pocket. That Johnny left his ring on my hearthrug. Eh? Oh! Examining the ring. On the old thing, it seems to be. They stand together for a time not speaking, he handling the ring, amused, she eagerly but irresolutely eyeing it. Then he offers it to her silently, and she slips it hastily into her pocket, putting her gun under her arm. You... you have taken a great deal of trouble. Pooh! Not worth talking about. Uh... uh... good afternoon. As she is going, she meets Fitton, and says to him, Oh, you've come back for me, I suppose? Eyeing Litterly, and speaking to Noeline. Beg pardon, my lord, for interrupting. Litterly strolls away. Er, uh, Fitton, this is my cousin, Lord Litterly. Uh, a sort of accident has brought him into the park. Accidents will happen, my lord. My mother would be extremely angry if she knew. Joe, I don't think it's necessary to tell her about it. Oh, come on. Detaining her. My lord, it bain't no good going arter to others. What do you mean? Lord William and Lord Thomas and me worked round from plantations to Hexley Bottom, and just as we was all picking our way across the brook, darn me if we didn't fall over two other gentlemen. Joe! Rubbing his head. Odd rabbit it, if we get another shot this afternoon. Why, where are Lord Willie and Lord Tommy? Walking about we and talking to an... Going to Litterly. Do you know anything of this? The keeper says there are two men in the park with my brothers, my sisters. Lord Tweenways and André de Grival. Oh. They're with me. I'm with them. We're with each other. Facing him indignantly. You. You. You are precisely what I first thought you. She runs off, following her. No, I'm not. Lady Nolin, what is it you thought me? I say. Disappears after her calling after them. You won't find him there, I tell ye. They'll be away by Axley Bottom. Turning away. Oh, dang it. Boys will be boys, they do say. Lord, seems to me boys will be girls here in Overcoat Park. Wilhelmina enters below the hedge, followed by de Graval. To Fitton. Joe, have you seen Lord Noel? Pointing off. He's gone arter ye, my lord. We're another gentleman. Lord Latterby or some sitch. To de Graval. Lord Litterly is with Noel. Partly to herself. Then Noel can't be so very angry with me and Tommy. Taking Fitton aside. Fitton? Wilhelmina gives instructions to Fitton. Thomason enters from above the hedge, followed by Tweenways. Leaning on the gate. Billy, Lord Tweenways and Monsieur de Greville will take tea with us, of course. Don't forget, extra cups and saucers to come down from the house. I am ordering them now. Stamping her foot. You're making me do everything. Come on, Tweenways. You must see our new Hereford bulls. She goes off. Hesitating at the gate. To himself. She will take me to the cattle. To de Graval. Get away from here as soon as you can. I'm coming back. My friend, you must find some other place to make your love in. I want it. In the distance. Tweenways! Oh! Going, and saying to himself as he looks at de Graval indignantly. Insolent! Insolent! He follows Thomason. To Wilhelmina. Don't he be afeard, my lord. I'll make it all right with you at. To himself. You at don't get no more game out of me for his sister in London if he can't keep his mouth shut. Fitton disappears. Wilhelmina sits on the tree stump, and de Graval comes down and kneels by her side. Monsieur de Graval! Wilhelmina, ah, you are adorable, you are enchanting, you are perfect, oh, you are, you are, you are pretty good. With her handkerchief to her eyes. 
Oh, it isn't kind of you to be so persistent. Faint heart never won a fair-haired young lady, don't you know? But nothing, nothing would ever reconcile my mother to your nationality. She shifts her gun from one knee to another, the muzzle chancing to point towards de Graval. My nationality, absurd trifle. Disconcerted by the presence of the gun. French by birth, yes, but English in my appearance, English in my... Uh, Rising, going behind Wilhelmina and kneeling on her left. French by birth, yes, but English in my appearance, manner, voice. Do I not play your games, your golf, your cricket? No, not your cricket. Do I not speak your proverbs? Set a thief to catch himself, all of them. Do I not say damn it all in the smoking room? Oh! No, I do not. You don't fully realize the extent of my mother's prejudice. According to her notion, a Frenchman can never be a thorough sportsman. How wrong the notion! For example, let her once see me riding in the paper chase. In the paper chase, nine out of ten, I am always, always, in at the disease, I... I assure you, that would weigh very lightly with my mother. Inadvertently, she again shifts her gun, so that it points at de Graval's face. Oh, please, please give up hoping, Monsieur de Graval. Again uncomfortable. Give up hoping, give up, do you imagine? It is not pos. Rising, he takes the gun from Wilhelmina and places it against the opposite tree. Pardon me, never play with edged guns. Tweenways enters quickly, followed by Thomason. Tweenways opens the gate to let Thomason through, then closes it sharply and looks off. Coming down to Wilhelmina. Tweenways has been admiring our Herefords. Knowingly. Has he? Ha <laughs> ha! I laugh eyeing de Graval witheringly. I would much like Monsieur de Graval to examine the Hereford balls. Ah, perhaps Lady Wilhelmina? Going up to the gate. With pleasure, Monsieur de Graval. You honour me. Tweenways opens the gate, Wilhelmina passes through. De Graval follows, then returns for the gun, saying to himself, In case prevention is better than being run after, to Tweenways, insultingly in passing him. Don't you know? Falling back. Ah! Wilhelmina goes off, followed by de Graval. Then Tweenways climbs on to the gate, looking after them. Insolent! May they toss him like a common coin! Insolent! He joins Thomason, who is sitting on the stump, lighting a cigarette. Offering him her cigarette case. Smoke? Thank you, no. We Fitzbrays do not smoke. How a man can exist without it puzzles me. We drink. No, what, too much? Alternate generations have the drink bias very clearly defined. Where do you come in? The predilection skips me. My father was called Three Bottle Tweenways, but in one way and another he made a good deal of history in his time. It must be a bad business to be a tippling Tweenways. Walking away a little annoyed. Pardon me, we don't think so. Following him. I say, Tweenways, I'm still thinking over what you've told me about this fellow Litterly, following my brother Noel from town and intruding himself here. Pray dismiss the topic for the moment. Lady Thomason, for the third time, I love you. Oh, shut up, Tweeny. We, we are always listened to. Stamping her foot. Oh! She goes to the gate and leans upon it, with her back towards him, walking to and fro. Lady Thomason, it would be an easy task to descant on your beauty, your amiability, but when I express my conviction that my family would regard our engagement with favour, it seems to me I say everything. Heavens, what a test to apply to a woman, and yet you emerge from the ordeal unscathed. The Fitzbray legend runs. To himself. Dash it, how does it run? To herself. Of course Tweeny's right. The fellow must have been simply attracted by Noel's face. Confound him. I've got it. Search the south and sweep the north. Scour the east and spoil the west. Speed your emissaries forth to the fairest 
and the best. Storm the city's topmost heights, steal about the countryside. When every grace in one unites, you will have found a Fitzbray's bride. To herself. The mate has often told us that those other bell turbots are outsiders. Resuming his march. On the subject of my claims upon your esteem, my own mouth is necessarily closed. But there's a sentence in a letter I received yesterday from my sister, Lady Clundolfi. Searching for a letter. Which, perhaps, you ought to... Finding it. Ah! He produces a letter and a large reading glass in a case, eyeing the reading glass. Hello, what's that machine? We have no sight to speak of. Reading. One thing, dearest Galfred, I would urge upon you, to guide you in your quest of a woman fitted to figure with you in history's page, and that is the constant reflection that you preserve in your own person all that is noblest and best of the medieval spirit. Advancing to Thomason. Lady Thomason. Look here, old man. We are delighted to see you here to tea while the mate is away to show you the Herefords and all that, but drop the rest. Even if I were inclined to turn myself into a girl, which I ain't, the mater wouldn't hear of anybody but a man with a chest that'd take you the best part of the afternoon to drive round. Putting away the letter and glass. Can it be possible? However, we have never hesitated at self-sacrifice. If you could suggest an easy means of muscular development... By Jove! Tweeny, if you did want to show what you're made of... Made of? This fellow literally, our cousin, who sneaks into our park after a pretty face. You could do it if you liked. Do what? You know a lot of bad language, naturally. My grandfather was called Round Oath Reginald. His swearing made history. I know some, too, only the mater bars that. Well, when you come across literally again, you use yours, will you? To literally? Certainly. Tell him what we all think of his conduct. I... I should have little hesitation. Uh, in... Good man. Running across to the right. Hello. Eh? Eh? Here he is with Noel. Tweenways hazily makes for the thicket. No, no, not that way. Over here. Noeline and Litterly enter below the hedge, talking. Litterly carries Noeline's guns, which he ultimately places against the hollow tree. Embarrassed at encountering Thomason and Tweenways. Er, uh, Tommy, this is Lord Litterly. To Litterly. My brother, a sister, Thomason. Litterly bows to Thomason, who inclines her head stiffly and then turns her shoulder upon him. To Noel. My friend, Lord Tweenways. To Tweenways. My brother, Noel. Tweenways bows. Noeline returns his salute haughtily, taking Thomason aside. Why do you treat Lord Litterly, a cousin, so very coolly? How dare he come here? He chances to be the young man who is useful to me in London. Gracious, the creature who dangled you like a baby. Be silent. He has the good taste to gloss over that. Where's Willie? With Andre de Greville. You're behaving like blackguards, both of you. Fetch your brother at once. Going through the gate. Certainly. Our friends have tea with us, you may like to hear. Oh, the idea of such a thing. Are you going to ask literally? It would be a marked impoliteness not to do so. I thought as much. I'll box your ears to-night. Noel, if you domineer when I get indoors, I... I... I'll be perfectly uncontrollable. Turning away. Impudent fellow. Thomason goes off. Tweenways advances towards Litterly, who is sitting on the root of the tree. Finding he is alone with Litterly. Ah, uh, Litterly, have you considered whether it is quite the act of a gentleman to... to... Rove about a place where, for family reasons, it is obviously, ah, uh, undesirable, eh? My dear chap, I haven't thought at all about it. Glaring at Tweenways. Have you? No, I haven't. He turns and goes through the gate irresolutely, looking to the right. Herefords! He quickly turns to the left and disappears, 
Noeline and Litterly approach each other rather constrainedly, looking at his watch. I say, Lady Noeline, is the 4.45 a decent train? You return by it? Bound to. I dine out to-night. Then I won't press you to wait for tea. Tea? Tea comes down from the hall directly. Hang the train. It's only a man's dinner. You mustn't disappoint your friends. Good-bye. He grips her hand tightly, and she cries out. Oh! What? Holding her wrist. I have a sprained wrist. Taking her hand again. I say, I am sorry. I am afraid I— Looking at a mark upon her wrist. Hello. What's that? Nothing. N. My initial. What's it doing there? I am sure you'll lose your train. Who put it there? Oh, when we were quite small boys, Willie and Tommy and I, we used to tattoo each other on wet days. The nearest way to the station— Looking at her wrist. By Jove! How did you manage it? Oh, dear, oh, dear! If you must know, there's a scrubby little plant with a scarlet sap growing here at Overcoat that does it. Walking about, looking upon the ground. It's early for it, but I dare say I can find you a sprout. Plucking a root. Yes, this is it, I believe. Breaking the stalk and showing it to him. There, you simply make punctures and paint them with the sap. He takes a sprig and examines it. The nearest way to Scrumley Station. Looking at his wrist, then at her. Would you mind carving something on me? I? Drawing herself up. Really? I say do. I say— Stamping her foot. What a maddening trick you have of saying I say. Forgive me for remarking it. I know it's a rotten habit. I say— I beg your pardon. I mean, if you'd write me just one little letter— Lord Litterly? On my wrist? It would remind me to drop saying I say— I fear the habit must remain unchecked. She walks away and with her back to him, picks some more of the plant. To himself, pulling the sprig to pieces. She hates me like poison. She hates me not. She... I've half a mind to pay her out for snubbing me like this. I could do it too, if I chose to tell her of that trifling little circumstance I kept back. <laughs> Why shouldn't I? <laughs> She hates me like rats. She hates me not. Lady Noline. Not turning. Yes? I say, there's something on my conscience I should like to get rid of before I go. On your conscience? Well, when I told you the tale of my picking up that nice young fellow the night before last, I left out one little occurrence. You left out one little occurrence? It happened while his brain was wandering, just as we— but very likely you wouldn't think it belongs to the story. Perhaps you will give me the opportunity of judging. With pleasure. On one condition. What's that? Tapping his wrist. That you'll write me that letter. Certainly not. As a memorial of an awfully jolly adventure? And that would be the price of the omitted episode? turning up his shirt-cuff. The reserve price. I wouldn't pay it to buy the whole county. Turning down his shirt-cuff. Episode bought in. Oh, you have really something to tell. Honour bright. I, I think your behaviour is infamous. Drawing a long silver pin from her hair and approaching him. You have no objection to this? Turning up his cuff again. Delighted. She sits on the stump, and he stands on her left, extending his wrist. What letter? N will do. I prefer any other letter, please. Oh, N stands for lots of things. N's for nothing. Oh. She makes the punctures, sitting beside her. You can't reach. As she makes the punctures. This will be a vile N, I promise you. Wincing. You must have been plucky kids to stand much of this. Becoming interested in her work. We were, 
plucky kids, as you express it. Tommy especially. Tommy? I remember. It was on Tommy I used to make the most elaborate designs. Poor Tommy! And have those frescoes faded? I think you are the most inquisitive person I have ever met. Sorry. No, I wish they would die out. They occasion such serious inconvenience now. Do they? How? Oh, really, if you will know everything. When Thomason visits as a girl, it is impossible for her to appear to advantage at dances or any low-necked function. Sticking the hairpin in her coat. There. Robbing the broken stalk of the plant upon his wrist. I wish you joy of this N. They rise. Listening. I think the others are coming. What is it you left out of your story? Be quick, please. Turning down his cuff. I shouldn't have mentioned it. Only, I think a chap who's fond of his mother must have a lot of good in him, and so it's no more than just to that Johnny. Fond of his mother? Explain yourself. Well, after I'd carried him up those seven-and-twenty stairs— Clenching her hands. Oh, yes. After I'd carried him up those stairs, I stopped for wind on the landing, and it was then that nice young fellow sighed and groaned and put his arm around my neck. He didn't. And called me mother in a whisper. He didn't know what he was up to, of course, but it showed his good instincts. Any... anything more? One thing more. I couldn't stop his doing it, you know. My own arms were engaged. Stop his... doing what? As he said good night, mother, in a dreamy way, he kissed me. That's the incident. When's tea? Oh! Oh! She turns upon him fiercely, deeds him a sounding blow upon his ear, and walks away, looking after her. Does the invitation to tea still hold good? Wilhelmina, de Graval, and Thomason come through the gate. With de Graval timidly. Noel, may I introduce Monsieur de Graval? Advancing to Noel gallantly. Lady Nolin, I am charmed to be here and not ask. Opening the gate. The tea? Look sharp, Yote. Don't go to sleep, Fitton. Litterly is presented to Wilhelmina. Uat and Fitton enter through the gate, carrying a large square basket and some camp stools. They open the basket and arrange the tea things on the tree stump. Thomason assisting while Litterly busies himself in placing the camp stools. After the tea is laid, Uat removes the basket and takes up a position by the gate. Fitton goes off. To Uat while tea is being laid. What's the matter with you, Yot? Wagging his head. Oh, my lord, what are we all a-coming to? We're all a-coming to tea directly. Oh, the disgrace to the park. Yote, if you ever breathe a word to a soul. Don't think it to me, my lord. To Thomason, who is carrying camp stools. I say, let me help. Glaring at him. Thanks, awfully. To himself. The little un's no friend of mine. To herself. Impudent interloper. To himself. Rude little mass of tattoo. Tea, tea, come along, Noel. Sit down, Willie. There you are, Monsieur de Greville. The girls sit upon the camp stools, the men upon the ground. Noel pouring out tea with Litterly on her left. Thomason is in the centre with Wilhelmina and de Greville on her right. To himself. Ah. A sad stain on the park. To Noeline, wrapping his handkerchief round his wrist. You observe I am stopping to tea? I can hardly avoid doing so. Ah, please don't draw attention to your wrist in that way. Putting his handkerchief away. I say, did my cousin Thomason tingle like this when she was frescoed? Wincing. Oh! Looking about. Where's Tweenways? Yes, where's Tweeny? Where is my friend Tweenways? Lord Tweenways! Lord Tweenways! Hola! Tweeny! Tweenways! In the distance. Coming! He crawls out of the thicket. 
Tea. Sitting. Thank you. Uat comes and hands the tea. Quietly to Tweenways. Tweeny, have you spoken your mind to Litterly yet? I thought of waiting till I get him in town. We always deliberate before expressing our views. Well then, you must arrange with me exactly what you're going to say. Look here, will you and André de Greville come up to the hall tonight when it's dark and have a quiet chat about it with Willie and me? Come up to the hall? Not to the door, of course. You'll have to lower yourselves through a skylight. I'll write you out instructions. Tweenways produces a letter, tears off the half-sheet, and gives it to Thomason, who writes on it with pencil. There is the sound of the loosening of a string of Wilhelmina's guitar in the hollow of the tree. Starting up. Ah, uh, what? A string of my guitar. Taking the guitar case from the tree. Oh, you play, you sing. No, no. Taking the guitar from the case. Lady Nolan, my dear Barrington, twin ways. Persuade. Handing the guitar to Wilhelmina. Don't you know? Lady Wilhelmina? Do, Willie. Ah, uh, if you like. Wilhelmina strikes a chord. To himself, breathing. We loathe music. Wilhelmina sings a simple song in two verses. At the end of the first verse. I say, charming. Ah, bravo, bravo, pretty good. Quietly to Uat, giving him the note she has written. Take this to Monsieur de Greville. Uat gives the note to de Greville, who reads it. Wilhelmina sings the second verse of the song and is applauded. Quietly to Tweenways. I've given André de Greville written directions how to... how to call upon us. Glaring at de Greville. Why to him? Don't you like him? We, we are accustomed to take the lead in such matters. To everybody. Any more tea? Lord Tweenways, Lord Litterly, Monsieur de Gibral? The men decline. Noeline rises, and they all follow. Tweenways quietly disappears. Noeline and Litterly stand together. Fiton re-enters. He and Uat replace the tea-things in the basket, fold the camp-stools, and finally deposit them on the basket. Then Uat goes off through the gate, and Fiton goes away to the left. Lady Noline, permit me to thank you for a most delightful day. Delightful. You are still nursing your arm, I see. My arm is exceedingly painful. I wouldn't lose a throb of it. I... I struck you, I'm afraid. There's a singing in my ear, but it's your voice. Perhaps I... I ought to apologise for losing my temper. Please forget it. No, don't deprive me even of the recollection of your temper. To de Graval, who is replacing the guitar in the tree. Goodbye, Monsieur de Graval. No, no, he's coming up to the hall by and by with Tweeny to have a smoke and a chat with you and me. Tommy! Now, boys, where are the guns? The guns are collected and Wilhelmina, Thomason, and Noelin stand together, guns in hand. We've just time to walk through Silverthorn Coppice before dusk. Taking her place between Wilhelmina and Thomason. Gentlemen, a final word. Looking round. Where is Lord Tweenways? Tweenways! Tweeny! Tweenways, my friend! Tweenways! Tweenways, Tweenways enters from below the hedge. A red flush suffuses his nose and cheeks. Oh, dear! Queer, Tweeny. We ought never to take tea. Gentlemen, my brothers and I bid you good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We have been extremely wrong in receiving you here. Yes. You are almost equally to blame for permitting us to do so. Ah, yes. No doubt about that. We ask you to forget that you have entered Overcoat Park. In a few hours the grass will revive where you have trodden. Let that be a hint to your memories. Now be kind enough to leave the park at once. Good-bye." The men advance together and shake hands with the girls. Thanks for a splendid time. Most interesting day. Ah, I have liked myself here. The men return to their places, raising their hats as the girls go through the gate. Where's Fitton? Joe! 
He'll follow. Come, boys. They disappear. Sunset appears. Litterly sits thoughtfully. Tweenways and de Graval stand together, eyeing him. To Tweenways. What to do? How to give Barrington the slip? We simply leave the park now with him and walk to the station. Don't you know? It will be easy to invent an excuse for our not sharing his compartment. For instance, he will smoke. Ah, necessity is the mother of objecting to a smoking carriage. Just as the train is starting, we two get out and speed back to Overcoat. My friend, how quick the brain! We are seldom at a loss. Advancing to Litterly. You catch the next train, I presume, Litterly. Oh, I catch it or lose it. To himself. She's glorious. De Graval and I catch it. Good luck, old chaps. To himself. She's splendid. It would have been pleasant for us to have finished the day together. Don't bother about me. I may stroll about and go back later. De Graval and Tweenways retire and consult together. To Tweenways. What to do? We are seldom at a loss. Your plan has broken up. Dash it! Manage it yourself! Coming to Litterly. My dear Barrington, our word to the ladies. Honest is the best way out of the park. Taking Tweenway's arm. Tweenway's and I now go. Rising. Oh? Which way? The way we entered. All right. Run along. Which way do you? The way I entered. Waving his hand. See you soon. Waving his hand. A pleasant picnic together. Goodbye. Taking out a cigarette. Ta-ta. Glaring at Litterly. He drops us. Insolent. Tweenways and de Graval go off, arm in arm, below the hedge. Litterly espies Thomason's note, which de Graval has dropped by the tree. Picking up the note. Hello? Reading. Dear Monsieur de Grival, I am asking you and Tweenways to come up to the hall when dark, to see me and Billy, and to talk about snubbing this horrid Litterly, who no one excepting Noel likes poking his nose about our park. Illiterate little beast! We can't entertain you tip-top, as it must be in our old shut-up schoolroom, but there will be a decent weed, and— Please heaven slows in brandy. The following is the way in. Looking after Tweenways and de Graval. Confound em. Skirt the lawn and make for east wing clamber on to the red tiled lean to outhouse. From there on to roof of dwarf tower. Find the skylight, lift up skylight and drop through. Wait in the dark till we turn up. Tweeny has accepted. Keep your eye on him when on the roof, as he is a bit gone over at the knees. Yours up to date, T. Beltabet. Designing little massive tattoo. I say, by Jove, I'll play the deuce with these fellows. De Graval runs up, scared hatless and disordered. My dear Barrington. Slipping the note into his pocket. Hello. We have encountered not a pirate. No, no, a poacher. We are hurt. Where's Tweenways? Tweenways enters. His hat is crushed down over his eyes. His clothes are torn. And generally he presents evidence of having been engaged in a struggle. Embracing Tweenways. My friend. Pulling de Graval away. What have they been doing to you, Tweeny? Just as we got to the brook, great hulking brute, putting down nets, never heard such language in my life, wanted to know why an honest man wasn't allowed to earn a living. I said we never answered questions of that sort. My head. Yes, yes, the wretch knocked de Graval's head against mine. Twice. Three times. Possibly. I left off counting. Luckily, somebody came up and enabled us to get away. A poaching beast come on you chaps detaining litterly no no don't interfere he's choking the keeper litterly runs off 
Oh, it's a filthy park. Leaning against a tree. My head is a very bad one. Feeling his leg. We can't stand being knocked about. Heavens, this limb is injured. Did you see me kick him? Kick him? The poacher. I thought I had broken him. Fool, that was my leg. Orts, a most forbidding-looking rustic, emerges from the thicket. Turning. Ah, there he be again. Get he out of my way. Flinging de Graval to the ground and dealing tweenways a blow which knocks him down. No, I be a poor agricultural labourer. Give me all the gold you got, honey. Emptying his pockets. Oh, this is an atrocious park. Giving his money to Orts. Go away. Farming be bad in these parts, I tell ye. This be ain't all. We never carry much loose money. Then I'll blacken thy other eye for ye. My friend changed a note this morning. Try my friend. Orts turns to de Graval, who commences to search for his money. To de Graval. I tell ye, I be thoroughly deserving. Thy gold. Litterly enters from below the hedge, followed by Fitton. He seizes Orts and pinions him from behind. Your belt, Fitton. Do you know the scoundrel? Fitton takes a strap from his waist, and he and Litterly secure Orts's arms. John Orts, my lord, a poacher since he were a babby. I be the sole support to me mother, I be. Not a single Sunday morning service have I missed at Scrumley Church this ten year. Now then, Fitton, what shall we do? If we make police business of this, my lord, it'll come out there's been some rakes about the park after our young gentleman. Folks will be talking. That's true. Better run the scoundrel off the place and have done with him. Another moment and I should have had his name and address. To Fitton. Pat my friends on their legs. To Orts. Get on. Going. I were at the church choir five years, singing like a cherry bim. He disappears, literally following him. Raising Tweenways. Hey, thy left eye be a rummin. Tweenways sits on the stump of a tree. His eye is slightly discoloured. Fitton picks up de Graval, almost in tears. Heavens, what a park! To Fitton. A doctor very near? Tell me. If it be only bruises, sir, Bowser, High Street Scrumley, chemist and druggist. To Tweenways. My friend, let us go and be drugged. Looking at Tweenways, who rises. Ah, a great change in you. We scar quickly. Taking his arm. It is a wise father who knows his own friend when he has such a bad eye. Tweenways and de Graval disappear. After a brief pause, de Graval returns, calling to Tweenways. In a moment I come after you. To fit on hurriedly. Mister, what your name? I did not rescue you from that pirate, that poacher. Touching his cap. No, sir, that I swear you didn't. No, but it would not hurt you to swear I did. Uh, well, sir. Listen to me. Taking a handful of money from his pocket, Tweenways, re-entering unperceived, steals down suspiciously and stands behind de Graval and Fitton, listening. You go to Lady Wilhelmina directly at once. Giving him money. One sovereign, you tell her of this affair. Giving him money. Two pound, you say I found that poacher strangling your throat. Giving him money. Another, you tell Lady Wilhelmina I kick him, I rescue you, I kick you. No, no, I kick him again. I save your life, ah, bravely. Giving him more money. Don't you know? Coming between Fitton and de Graval. Monsieur de Graval. Ah. Permit me to say that, if any representation of this kind is made, I, I must be. In it? Tweenways bows with dignity. I have no objection. To Fitton. You will see Lady Thomason as well as Lady Wilhelmina. Searching his pockets. Monsieur de Graval and I found the poacher choking you. This gentleman and I, at great personal risk, preserved your... Heavens! That villain has my money! Ah! Uh. 
producing money and offering it to Tweenways. I loan you. To himself, hesitating. Can I? Taking the money and giving it to Fitton. You understand? Touching his cap. Yes, my lord. Tweenways moves away. To Fitton, pointing to Tweenways. We now save your life, both of us, ah, bravely, don't you know? I know, sir. Going to Tweenways. We reconcile each other. Tweenways reluctantly extends two fingers. De Gaval cheerfully takes his arm again. My friend. They go off. It is now dusk. Counting his money. Dang it, it won't do me no hurt telling a few lies about him. Two, three, four. Litterly re-enters. Where are my friends, Fitton? Pocketing the money. Oh, they be just gone. To himself, chuckling. By Jove, I mean to play old Harry with them. <gasps> I... Sitting and holding his arm. Oh, I say. Twisted thy arm, lord. Taking out his pocket handkerchief. Fitton, wrap this handkerchief round my wrist as tightly as you can. To himself. Ha! Oh, oh, these fellows! Looking at Litterly's arm. Eh, the scoundrel's hurty. No, no, Lady Dolene was kind enough to do that with a hairpin and a red root that grows about the park. Lady Nolene and I are cousins, you know, Fitton. Go on. A red root that grows hereabouts. Yes. Putting his foot on a piece of the root which lies on the ground. Here's a bit of it. Picking up the root. That. In the distance, calling. Joe! Hello! Fitton! Going to the gate. The young gentlemen be on their way back to the hall. Litterly hastily conceals himself behind a tree. Noeline enters. Stopping at the gate. Fitton, why do you leave us like this? To Noeline, over the gate. Excuse me, my lord. Showing the sprig he has in his hand. Be that the weed you've been rubbing young Lord Litterly's arm with? Who told you anything about that? Take my gun, I'm going home. My lord, this be the wrong stuff, I tell ye. Eh? The red root hasn't grown here at Overcoat many a year. This air be crimson snakewort. It be a rank bad poison, they do tell me. Coming through the gate. Fitton! Looking towards the tree. Shh! Fitton, you don't mean to say I really hurt my cousin's arm? Lord Litterly, my lord. Noeline sees Litterly. Fitton goes quietly away. Litterly advances to Noeline. Oh, Lord Litterly! I say, here's a game. A game? Don't stand there looking at me. Get out of the park. Why did you ever come here? Go, go to Dr. Flack at Great Overcoat. Don't you hear me? Shaking him. Run, run to Dr. Flack. Why, I've never been to a doctor in my life. You must now. Clinging to him. Oh, oh. Supporting her soothingly. Don't, don't. Ah, I know how to hold you. Getting away. How dare you! I, I hate you. Do you? Then I swear to go to no doctor. Pshaw, what do I care? It serves you right. Going up to the gate and opening it, while he sits whistling. Then, hesitating and returning to him. Lord Litterly. Hello. Won't anything make you go to the doctor? Yes. Tell me you don't hate me. After a pause. I don't hate you. He rises and clasps her in his arms. Thomason and Wilhelmina enter, followed by Fitton. At the gate. No! Noeline and Litterly separate, meeting Litterly and speaking fiercely. What do you mean by this? Ha <laughs> ha! Cousin Tommy! He throws his arms around Thomason and kisses her. He runs off, rubbing her face vigorously with her handkerchief and speaking to Noeline. You! You! Do you call yourself a man? No. I'm a girl. I don't want to be anything else. She runs off through the open gate. Wilhelmina, Thomason, and Fitton remain looking after her. End of the second act
The Third Act of the Amazons, a farcical romance by Arthur W. Pinero. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The scene is a gymnasium at Overcoat Hall, a large apartment artistically decorated and fitted with gymnastic apparatus. Halfway up the room is an arch, which, supported on two pilasters, divides the ceiling from the skylights. A door on the left opens on to a passage, while on the right is the door of a spacious cupboard. A vaulting horse, a suspended rope, parallel bars, and a horizontal bar are prominent features of the apartment, while there are also a settee, table, and upright pianoforte. The place is in darkness, but a faint blue is seen through the skylights and the large window at the end of the room. After a short silence, there are the sounds of men's voices in whispers and the breaking of glass. Then a man's hat drops from above, and de Graval is seen descending with difficulty with the aid of the rope. In a whisper to Tweenways, who is above, Tweenways, my friend, be careful. It is not easy. Out of sight. Oh, look out! I'm descending. Coming down. Hold the thing. Hold it. Hold where? Nearly down. The rope. He falls. Ah. Under his breath. Fool. Fool. You are hurt. Crawling along. Heavens, yes. De Graval picks him up. Their appearance is very dilapidated. De Graval's clothes are soiled, his hair has become lank, and there is a star-shaped patch of white plaster on his brow. Tweenways wears a small black shade over his injured eye. One thing we may congratulate ourselves. We arrive. Arrive? How can I be certain that we have strictly carried out Lady Thomason's instructions? The mere idea of your losing that note fills me with... Walking against the vaulting horse. Oh! My friend, what is done cannot be made different. Coming into contact with the support of the horizontal bar. Ah, uh, damn it all! Examining the vaulting horse and the horizontal bar with the aid of his magnifying glass. De Graval? I have a shocking misgiving. Misgiving? Heavens, I believe we're in the gymnasium. Gymnasium? Our instincts are rarely at fault. Coming against the parallel bars. Oh. You are hurt? Yes. But I remember Lady Thomasine's letter, every word of it. Holding his head. Clamber on to our old schoolroom, find a skylight in a roof. Lift up the tiles of an outhouse, climb on to a tower, drop off and wait there till we turn up. Yours gone over at the knees, T. Belterbet. Tweenways falls over the Indian clubs. There is a great rattle. You are hurt again? Yes, but wasn't there something about the West Wing? You said so. Certainly, the West Wing. Or the, uh, I think. You think? My friend, pardon me. I fear I have changed a wing. To himself. Fool, fool. Starting back as his hand drops onto the keys of the piano. Oh. You are hurt. No, I am not. Joining him. What to do? You may do what you please, Monsieur de Graval. So far as I am concerned, this visit to Overcoat has come to a wretched close. He goes to the rope attempts to climb it, and fails. Watching him. Ah, you cannot. Heavens, it's beyond me. Sitting on the settee despondingly. What a horrible predicament. This reminds me of many a page in our history. The dungeon, the prisoner. Rubbing his shins. Even the implements of torture. Sitting beside him in great dejection. My spirits go. We have no spirits. Taking his hand. My friend. A pair of legs appear from above, clinging to the rope. Oh! oh. What is it? Surely, legs. Ah, uh, Bilalmina. The legs descend and literally is revealed. De Graval and Tweenways rise. 
Barrington. Literally. Hello. There you are. Literally comes between de Graval and Tweenways. His arm is slung in a black silk handkerchief. Now then, I should like to know what you've got to say for yourselves. We never give explanations. You catch the next train, don't you? Really? This tone? It would be pleasant to finish the day together, wouldn't it? Our word to the ladies. Honesty is the best way out of the park. Taking Tweenway's arm. Tweenway's and I now go. My friend. Releasing himself. You may not be aware, literally, that de Graval and I are here in the position of invited guests. Oh, yes, I'm aware of it. Handing Thomason's note to de Graval. I picked up the invitation. Ah! And you may not be aware, my dear Tweeny, that that invitation directs you to the East Wing, and you are now in the West Wing. Monsieur de Graval! Ah, I commit an error. Pardon me. Never. We never forgive an injury of this kind. To Litterly. How am I to get out? The rope. Bah, he cannot climb it. Nor you, sir. Under his breath. Insolent. You say so, I try. He goes to the rope and attempts to climb it, walking about. I followed you fellows over about five miles of roof. Where the deuce have you got to? Why, I say, confound you, we're in the gym. I knew it. I felt it. By Jove, this is too bad of us. We really ought to draw the line somewhere. Pointing to the door. Isn't that the door? Opening the door cautiously. A passage and lights at the end of it. Closing the door. Opening the opposite door. A cupboard. Halfway up the rope. Ah, uh, I succeed. I triumph. I do it. Don't shall sure know. Bravo, Andre. We shall have to leave Tweeny behind us. Under his breath. Insolent. The electric lights are switched on and the scene becomes suddenly bright. De Graval descends precipitately. Ah, uh, heavens! I say! Voices! Voices! At the cupboard door. Look out, you fellows! De Graval runs into the cupboard, and literally pushes in Tweenways, who is hesitating, then goes in himself. After a brief pause, Sergeant Shooter enters. She wears a costume of coarse, dark material, a blouse, a skirt finishing just below the knees, and gymnasium shoes. At the door. Now then, my lord, where are the rest? A quarter of an hour late as it is. Thomason, Wilhelmina, and Noeline enter. They are enveloped in long cloaks. What's the matter with you this evening? You all seem as stupid as owls, every one of you. Don't you be cheeky, sergeant, or I'll tell the mater. I'll tell her ladyship. We are not inclined for the gym tonight. There. We, we've we had a rather tiring day, Sergeant. To Noeline, who is leaning dejectedly against the vaulting horse. Well, Lord Noel, if ever I did see anybody looking exactly like Putty. I don't care what I look like. Clapping her hands. Come along now. Key, please. Noeline locks the door and takes out the key, bringing down the Indian clubs. I always have said that when your lordships come back from these wretched holiday trips, your muscles are like apple jelly. Throwing her the key. Catch and be quiet. Shooter catches the key and slips it into her pocket, bringing down the barbells. If I were my lady, I'd stop visitings altogether. Noeline sits on the settee in an attitude of despondency. There's the result of it. I suppose you've been dancing half the night through in those petticoats of yours. Ah, I wonder you like to wear such things. Bringing down the dumbbells. Now then, Lord Tommy, Lord Willie. Wilhelmina and Thomason hurry forward sulkily, to themselves. Oh! oh. Turning up her sleeves. Ten minutes simple exercise to thaw the ice. Ready? Ready? Rising. Yes. 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 Come, my lords, a good appetite for dinner. Shooter sits at the piano and thumps out a strongly marked tune. The girls take off their cloaks and throw them down angrily. They are in elegantly made gymnasium dresses of different colours. 
pushing Thomason. There's no room for me here. This is my place. You're a most ungentlemanly fellow. Because I caught you kissing literally. What? Coming between them with the dumbbells in her hands. Oh, please don't quarrel again. Don't. Never interfere, Willie. Out of the way, baby. Wilhelmina is pushed over to the settee where she sits crying and rubbing the dumbbells into her eyes. To Thomason. At any rate, if I were to so far forget myself, I shouldn't be kissing a worm. You allude to my friend Tweeny. Swinging her clubs. You seem <coughs> to have no doubt <coughs> as to whom <coughs> the denomination <coughs> applies. <coughs> Fiercely, as she picks up a barbell. No, do you remember my dropping a forty-pound barbell onto Shooter's toes in the summer by accident? Clumsy, yes. Lifting her barbell. Well, it wasn't an accident. Oh? Shooter abruptly discontinues playing and looks around. Well, I never. You, you. All, All right, right sergeant. sergeant. They commence their exercise. Shooter resumes playing with an occasional glance round. Keeping one eye on Shooter, Thomason gets nearer to Wilhelmina. Speaking during her exercise to Wilhelmina. Billy, I wonder when we shall get to Tweeny and Agreeville. Poor fellows, how lonely they must be in the dark. I hope Tweeny hasn't broken a leg or anything. Oh, don't. He looks a bit brittle. Their exercise becomes languid. It was awfully plucky of Andre, protecting Fitton from that poacher, wasn't it? And Tweeny. I mean both. What did Fitton tell you about it? They cease their exercise altogether and, forgetting Shooter, sit on the settee side by side. Why, Fitton said that Andre lifted the poacher high in the air like a baby. That's right, and then threw him to Tweeny, who caught him ten yards off. What did Tweenways do then? Shook him blue and chucked him back to Andre. I shouldn't have thought Tweenways quite equal to all that. Nor I. Andre, you never know men. I suppose you oughtn't to. Noeline's exercise has flagged by degrees. She now sits on the vaulting horse with her back to the others. Just look at Noel. I suppose Noel calls that club exercise. I call it shirking. Tommy, it's an awful thing to realise, but after what we saw, there can be no doubt that Noel l l likes literally, eh? Doubt? Oh, things are getting pretty serious, that overcoat, don't you think? Billy, old chap, dashed if I know what the deuce is coming over us all. <sighs> Shooter again suddenly ceases playing, turns, and rises. I guessed it. In great commotion, the girls rush to their places and resume their exercise. I've caught you. Every bit of this shall go to my lady. Now, my lords, no more nonsense, please. Back with those toys. The girls replace the clubs barbells and dumbbells at the other end of the room. To Wilhelmina. We've made the sergeant wild now. And I've no chocolate in my pocket to get her round again. Gathering up the cloaks. Wiping the floor with these things, too. Isn't there a proper place for them? Lord Noel, Lord Willie, onto the bar, both of you. Lord Tommy, thirty volts, without stopping for wind. Noeline and Wilhelmina spring on to the horizontal bar and Thomason comes to the vaulting horse, as Shooter, carrying the cloaks, opens the cupboard door. The men appear. Shooter, dropping the cloaks, utters a yell of terror and runs over to the other side of the room. There is a general uproar. The girls scream. Tweenways running across the room is seized by Shooter and violently shaken. Escaping from her, he makes for the rope, where he meets de Graval, who has crawled under the vaulting horse. They attempt to climb the rope together, impeding each other's progress. It's literally Andre de Graval. Why, Tweeny? Hush, hush. Come back, you fellows. Be quiet, everybody. I say, do let me speak. Going to Litterly and shaking him. Who are you all? What are you doing here? Noeline comes down quickly, places herself between Litterly and Shooter, and seizes the latter by the collar. You coward shooter! Don't you see Lord Litterly's arm is in a sling? Staring at Litterly. 
Lord Litterly! Oh, my lord! Advancing to Shooter. Hello! Why, Letty! Oh, my lord, what is the meaning of this? I say now, don't upset yourself. I am glad to see you. Kissing her. Do you know what you're doing? You're kissing our sergeant. I should think so. Letty Shooter's my old nurse's daughter. We were brought up together. Letty was married from Bambridge Castle. Kissing Shooter again. I should think I am kissing your sergeant. Quietly to Noeline. Leave her to me. It's all right. Thomason, Wilhelmina, de Graval, and Tweenways are talking together with much animation. Noeline joins them. Shooter sinks on to the settee, holding her heart and panting. Litterly places himself beside her. I say, Letty, dear, how jolly! Jolly? Oh, dear, oh, dear! I'll never get over this fright. Pushing him away and attempting to rise. You wretch! Restraining her. What? When I haven't seen you for years? As if you came here to see me. Who are the others? My friends, Lord Tweenways and Monsieur de Grival. My lord's a sweetheart's up in Scotland. I've heard of it. She again attempts to rise. He pulls her back and puts his arm around her waist. Letty, I'll tell you something. Keep quiet. Whispering into her ear. I say. What? Lord Noel? He nods, laughing. Oh, I won't help you. Neither of you. She again tries to leave him. He rises and stands before her, pushing her back whenever she attempts to rise. Let it be reasonable. What are you frightened about? If I give you my word that I will personally be answerable for the perfect behaviour of your young gentleman, will that satisfy you? No. Why, Lady Castle Jordan's away, isn't she? She'll be home tomorrow. But we don't intend to stay till tomorrow. I'll take care of that. That's right. Always do your duty. Looking at his watch. Now, at what time do your young gentlemen dine? A quarter past eight. Then at a quarter to eight we leave. On your honour, my lord. Letty, on my honour. She rises. He kisses her again and puts her back. I am pleased to see you. Gentlemen, at a quarter to eight punctually we clear out. I have pledged my word to that effect to my dear old friend Mrs. Shooter. So I warn you, you must make the most of your time. Starting up. No, they mustn't. Running to Shooter and hugging her. Oh, Shooter, dear, you've never been so nice. Sergeant, you're a brick. Come and talk to Lord Tweenways and Monsieur de Graval. Your mind will be so easy. Thomasin and Wilhelmina take Shooter to Tweenways and de Graval. To Litterly, very coldly. What did Dr. Flack say about your arm? Rubbed stuff into it and made a frightful fuss. Oh, there isn't any danger, is there? Not the slightest. Right in a week. I knew there was no occasion for you to be so alarmed. She walks away, he following her. I say, what have I done now? Aren't you here? I came after Tweenways and de Graval. I didn't expect this would happen. As it has happened, you might have had the decency to shower your kisses on that woman in the cupboard. I would have done so if I'd thought that you— Oh, I don't protest against the vulgar exhibition on my account, but I have young brothers. I kissed her with a motive. I'm sorry to hear it. My old nurse's daughter. Fudge. No, no, all my life, I— Do your sisters kiss the head gardener's sons? Yes. No. Following her. I say. They sit together on the settee, wrangling. To Shooter. Come now, Sergeant, you might oblige a chap. They've been on the roof since six o'clock. I'd ring the alarm bell first. How am I to get a bottle of wine? You could wheedle it out of old Parker. Do, Shooter, darling. Taking her arm coaxingly. Monsieur de Graval is such a brave fellow. So's Tweeny. If I forged for refreshment for anybody, it would be for his lordship over there. Litterly? We'll give Lord Litterly his share. Do. My lords, if I fetch you some refreshments, will you promise me faithfully to get into that cupboard and stop there till I come back? Yes. yes. 
no, no, not all of you. Only my young gentleman. We understand, sergeant. Of course we will. Good man. Into the cupboard, then. Into the cupboard. The three girls hurry into the cupboard and close the door. Shooter unlocks the door that leads from the room. Going to her. I say, Letty, upon my word, you're a good sort. I wouldn't do this for any living soul but you, my lord. She waits, wiping her lips. He hesitates, annoyed, then kisses her. As he does so, the cupboard door opens and Noeline looks out. To herself, indignantly. Ah! As Shooter departs, Litterly turns and sees Noeline. Oh! She withdraws her head. To himself. Spotted! Just my luck! Ha! Tweenoise, my friend! We are on the clover! Sitting at the piano. Ha! I enjoy myself like a deuce! He plays, rattling off a gay French melody. To himself. Thomason is undoubtedly beginning to regard me with great warmth. I've never felt quite like this in my life. There's nothing I'm not capable of. Leaping onto the horizontal bar and swinging to and fro a few times, then crying out in pain, helplessly. Oh, literally, quick! Going to him and taking him down. Hurt yourself, Tweeny. Heavens, yes. He walks in a stooping posture to the settee and sits, doubled up, literally knocks at the cupboard door. Lady Nolene? Lady Nolene? From within. What do you want? Please, let me explain. Opening the door haughtily. Pray, don't think that any explanation is necessary. You see, if I didn't make it right with Letty Shooter... Oh. Coming out of the cupboard in her cloak, shutting the door behind her. Oh, how I long for a quarter to eight. Overcoat. The park. Our gym. I feel that nothing will ever be the same again. Pacing about, he following her protestingly, popping her head out of the cupboard. Here, no. Go back, Tommy, at once. I like that. Coming out, in her cloak, shutting the door behind her, and walking across to Tweenways. Sneak. Laying her head on the vaulting horse, despairingly. You see how I am treated? How I wish I could undo the past few days. Here, I say, don't cry. They sit together on the vaulting horse, pulling her head out of the cupboard. Tommy, you know I can't bear the dark. Ah, Wilhelmina, ah, my pretty girl. No, no. He takes her hand and brings her out of the cupboard. She is in her cloak. Thomason and Tweenways walk to and fro. I assure you, Lady Thomason, I attach no importance whatever to the slight affray. We, we... Slight? The poacher carried a loaded stick, Fitton said. Possibly, yes. I remember dashing it aside. Lucky for old Fitton, you and de Greville were on the spot. De Greville? Yes, didn't he? Waving his hand disdainfully. My dear Lady Thomason. Why, Fitton gave us to understand. That de Graval? Really? They walk away as Wilhelmina and de Graval come forward talking together. Ah, uh, Monsieur de Graval, we, my sisters and I, can't thank you sufficiently. Ah, uh, please, no. It thanks itself, besides how small a thing to do. To save a man's life. Why, perhaps but for Tweenways and yourself, Fitton would have been... Tweenways? Tweenways assisted you, Fitton told us. Ha, I laugh. What Fitton said? Absurd. I describe it. Fitton was on the ground with no sense when I kick him. When you kicked whom? Fitton. You kicked poor Fitton? No, no, I mean Tweenways. Why should you kick Tweenways? Ah, uh, I'm not telling it. I, I kick them all. Don't sure know. The attention of de Graval and Wilhelmina, Tweenways and Thomason, is attracted by Noeline and Litterly, who are sitting on the vaulting horse. Their heads are close together, and Litterly's arm placed lightly round Noeline's waist. Noel! Oh, Noel! Lord Litterly! Litterly and Noeline hastily dismount and face the others. Hey, What? What? Listening. Hark, here's the sergeant. Get back! Get back! Oh, I didn't know I was out. 
the three girls hurriedly return to the cupboard, literally throws himself full length onto the settee, and whistles unconcernedly. De Graval resumes his seat at the piano, playing with much energy. Tweenways rushes to the horizontal bar and hangs there without motion. Shooter enters, carrying a tray on which are a bottle of hock, some glasses, and a cake. Literally rises, takes the tray from her, and places it on the table. Shooter relocks the door and looks round suspiciously. Then she finds Wilhelmina's shoe, which, in the scurry, has been dropped. Picking up the shoe. Ah, oh, the deceitful young devils! She opens the cupboard door. Noeline re-enters the room, Thomason following her. Wilhelmina appears, timidly, searching for her shoe. Shooter produces it. You've been out! I must have been. Coming between Shooter and Wilhelmina. Now then, Willie wasn't the first to break our promise. I was. Nothing of the kind. I was. How presuming you are, Tommy. Oh, you, you, you bad lot, you. Litterly has filled the glasses and now advances with the tray. Now, now, now. We're all going to drink Letty Shooter's health. Oh, my lord. Litterly hands the tray from one to the other. To Wilhelmina. After such stirring adventures, a glass of champagne is particularly acceptable. It isn't champagne. It's our dinner hock. To himself. We hate hock. He sits moodily. The girls play shooter upon the vaulting horse. Now, bumpers, we'll drink long life and a second husband to Letitia Ann Shooter. Letitia Ann Shooter. Good man. Sergeant. Sergeant. Sergeant Shooter. The toast is drunk with acclamation. At the piano again, excitedly. Ah, uh, we are having a good time. If we danced, we should like it. Yes, yes, Sergeant, rattle off something for us. Oh, no. Tommy, be quiet. Binding the wheat sheaf, the old dance we dug up at Drumdoris. Oh, yes, Shooter knows that. Shooter takes de Graval's place at the piano, putting on some torn and soiled gloves. We, we are no dancers. They dance a quaint country dance, beginning demurely and increasing in energy as they proceed. De Graval is dancing alone, very wildly and fantastically, when the door opens and Lady Castle Jordan, who has apparently opened the door with a key attached to her chatelaine, enters with Minchin. Lady Castle Jordan stands as if stricken. Gradually the dancers fall back with the exception of de Graval, who does not see Lady Castle Jordan and continues dancing. Then he discovers his position and bolts into the cupboard. Lady Castle Jordan sinks upon the settee, looking before her with a fixed stare and sitting motionless. Shooter is still playing gaily. Minchin goes to her and taps her upon the shoulder. She stops playing, turns, rises, looks round, and totters out at the door. What is it? Roger Minchin? I am going mad, I think. What is it? Lady Noeline, you are the eldest of three, I still hope, not altogether worthless young women. But upon my word, unless you instantly furnish some reasonable explanation of the presence of these gentlemen, I shall find myself guilty of wishing that you had never been born mother this is my cousin your nephew literally comes forward staring at him what's that you say lord literally rendered me a great service in london though i didn't know till this afternoon to whom i was indebted for it that young man at overcoat he came here to restore me a ring i had lost he didn't find out until he had entered the park that he was at overcoat Cannot he make his own excuses? No, Lady Castle Jordan, I can't. And I, I, I say, Aunt Miriam. Stand away. Who are the others? There are others. Mater, Mater, Lord Tweenways begs me to present him to you. Tweenways? Tweenways, who has been under the vaulting horse, is now halfway up the rope. He bows from that elevated position. Lady Castle Jordan, I rejoice to find myself at Overcoat Hall. We, we... To Thomason. 
I see. The result of your stay at Drumdurris under Egidia's care. I am mightily obliged to her. I take the present opportunity. Come down! Tweenways descends rapidly. Mother dear, Monsieur de Greval. Raising her head. What? The other? Looking around. Andre! Andre! Minchin opens the outer door and calls de Greval. No one appears. The others call de Greval with the same result. Litterly enters the cupboard indignantly. There is a short pause, and then de Greval is shot out into the centre of the room. Litterly re-enters more leisurely, glaring at de Greval. So that is the Frenchman? French by birth, yes, but so long educated in England. English is my appearance, manner, voice, English to my backbone. Do I not play your games, follow your sport? Hush, hush! To de Greval, presenting him formally. Monsieur André de Greval, Lady Castle Jordan, my mother. With a profound bow. Ah, Lady Castle Jordan, damn it all. No! Upon my soul, sir. Ah, I do not say the right word. I mistake it. I despair. Hush, hush! I rave madly. Tonight I stab my throat. Don't you know? Oh! De Greval is dragged back by Litterly, rising. Roger Minchin, I wish to speak to my oldest child. Take these gentlemen away for a few moments. Minchin beckons the men who quietly retire into the cupboard. No. Minchin places a chair for Lady Castle Jordan. No. I went to town to receive a statement from Florence Vipont's maid, Dawkins. Oh, treacherous creature! The woman declares you sallied out the other night in young Robert Vipant's clothes. Is it true? Perfectly. Surely you can have no objection to such a proceeding, mother. No. Shaking a finger at Lady Castle Jordan. Ha! But you didn't return till early morning, according to Dawkins. You never heard me say I like that in a young man. No, mother. But I got mixed up in a street fight through protecting a girl from a brute who was going to hit her. I punched him, mother. What? You did? In the public street? Before people? You've had me taught to do such things. Ha! In the presence of strangers? Never. After I'd done it, I ran away, and fainted in a by-turning. Fainted? My son! But luckily Lord Litterly came along and picked me up and carried me home to his lodgings. Oh, my daughter. Minchin joins Wilhelmina and Thomason and talks with them. This morning he recognised me in Chesham Street and followed me here to return a ring I dropped in his room. Pacing to and fro. Disgraceful! Disgraceful! Yes, mother, it is disgraceful. But it will serve everybody a good turn, if it teaches us that, after all, your children are nothing but ordinary, weak, affectionate, chicken-hearted young women. No! Stamping her foot. No! No, Aline, from this moment! No, Aline! No, Aline! Lady Castle Jordan, I really think it due to Lord Tweenways and Monsieur de Greval that you should know they have stood you in good stead during your absence. Mr. Minchin? As the result of their perfectly inexcusable presence in your park, old Fitton, the keeper, has been rescued from the murderous clutches of a most determined poacher. Quite true, Mater. Tweenways may be bred a bit too fine, but in an emergency he's a demon. You should hear what Fitton says of Andre. I'll inquire about this. He goes out. Fitton or no Fitton, this shameful introduction of men into overcoat. If we're boys, we must have pals. The misery is we're neither one thing nor the other. In the gymnasium, dancing and drinking. A bottle of Rudesheimer. If one man can't give another a glass of wine. Into your frocks, into your frocks. Frocks? Into your frocks sinking into the chair. And never, never, never come out of them. 
Thomason and Wilhelmina go to the door. <laughs> I, I, I felt ashamed of my appearance for ever so long. I own it. She goes out. All right, turn me into a girl. But look here, I shall be just the sort of young lady that's likely to be an awful failure in the end. She goes out, pointing to the cupboard. Mother, don't forget they're in there. Oh, I had forgotten. I... I hope you'll like Litterly. You hope I will like... Do you? Yes. She goes out. Nolene, come back. Is it possible? My brain reels. She goes to the door, opens and shuts it, then goes and opens the cupboard door, calling sternly. Lord Tweenways? Monsieur de Greville? Lord Littley? Tweenways appears, encounters Lady Castle Jordan, and retreats. Lord Tweenways? Tweenways appears again, bows apprehensively to Lady Castle Jordan, and sidles round the cupboard door. De Greville enters, bows to Lady Castle Jordan, and, edging away from her, joins Tweenways. Littley enters. You desire to... To demand that you instantly leave Overcoat, and to tell you that I can find no words in which... Aunt Miriam! Aunt! How dare you remind me of our relationship! How dare you! Pausing and staring at him. Eh? You're not well. Have you ever been told that you have your late uncle's eyes? My father often says I recall his brother Jack. Why, if your hair wasn't quite so short, and if it was curly just there, and if you were an inch taller, and hadn't such an odious torn air, oh! She grasps his arms impulsively, then falls back with an exclamation. Aunt! Again grasping his arms. Pardon me. Leaving him. Mercy! His muscles are like my jacks. Minchin enters. My dear Lady Castle Jordan, Fitton happened to be in the game larder. He certainly has told me a story of almost incredible dash and presence of mind on the part of Lord Tweenways and Monsieur de Grival. Yes, 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 Mr. Minchin. Don't you see an extraordinary likeness in Italy to my Jack? There is a suggestion. A suggestion? Mr. Minchin, what, what ought I to do? A deep gong sounds in the distance. Dinner? What ought you to do? Begin at once to distract your girl's thoughts from the follies of the past. Demonstrate with as little delay as possible that you can be a reasonable mother. Glancing towards the men. Ask him to dine. What? They're all more or less injured. They must be all more or less hungry. Be more or less hospitable. No, no. If I ask anyone, it shall be only Littley. Why only Littley? He's so like my Jack. He's so like my Jack. You can't invite one blackguard without the others. A blackguard? When he's so like my Jack? Noeline, Wilhelmina, and Thomason enter dressed in demi toilette for dinner. Ha ha! To Minchin proudly. Ah, oh, yes, aren't they beautiful girls? Lord Tweenways, Lord Littley, Monsieur de Grivel, as you see, I am still in my early morning gown. On the score of dress, therefore, I beg you will have no hesitation in giving me the honour of your company at dinner. The girls, uttering little cries, sit suddenly upon the settee. Lady Castle Jordan! Ah, uh, I shall delight to eat. You're very good, my dear aunt. The girls rise and gather around their mother, kissing and embracing her. Oh, mother! Mother dear! Good business! Littily and Minchin meet and shake hands. Flourishing the Indian clubs. La, la, la! swinging on the horizontal bar. We carry everything before us. The gong sounds again. Lord Tweenways. 
between ways comes with great dignity to Lady Castle Jordan. The girls fall back. Lord Littley, Lady Nolene, Monsieur de Grival, Lady Wilhelmina, Mr. Minchin, Lady Thomasin. The couples are formed, and all go out sedately. The End of the Third Act And the End of the Amazons A Fosca Romance by Arthur W. Pinero